Welcome to this episode of Intellectual Conservatism. Today, I am here with two very special guests, Dr. Gavin Kerr and Stephen Namesh. Namesh, close enough. Close enough, okay, good. Uh, and uh, today we're gonna be talking about classical theism and the limits of analytic philosophy. So I'm gonna have both of the speakers, rather than introduce their backgrounds, since they've been around the internet quite often, just talk about um, their acquaintance with analytic philosophy, their educational upbringing. So I'll have Gavin go first. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, thanks very much. So as Swan said, um, I'm Gavin Kerr. Um, I kind of, you know, work on Aquinas, medieval philosophy, you know, contemporary presentation of all that sort of stuff. And just my intellectual upbringing was um, I did my uh, original degree at Queen's University Belfast, uh, started in 2001. And 10 years later, I left with a PhD in philosophy. And Queen's University Belfast was uh, an interesting place for philosophy because there were two distinct philosophy departments. One was just the, the Department of Philosophy. And then there was uh, another department called the Department of Scholastic Philosophy. And the Department of Philosophy was more or less the Department of Analytic Philosophy. And well, the Department of Scholastic Philosophy was Scholastic Philosophy. Um, now, after a while, those two departments kind of, you know, because of administrative issues were just pushed closer together and ultimately you had the Department of Philosophical Studies or the School of Philosophical Studies but still with those two clear divisions within it. And so my degree, my, my original undergraduate degree, was a joint degree in philosophy, philosophy in the analytic tradition, and scholastic philosophy. And um, I believe I was the first and the last to uh, undertake such a degree at Queen's University Belfast. Um, so I, I was the first to do a joint degree between the analytic and the scholastic philosophy. There were always students who would maybe take a module here and there, but I think I was the first and last to formally do a degree. I could be wrong on that, but I don't know of any other student that did that, that formally took a degree, you know, of a philosophy, analytic philosophy component and scholastic philosophy component. And um, within the analytic side of things, uh, we had some first rate philosophers, you know, some really great guys who, um, you know, some of them, you know, students of AJR, um, students of, you know, all the big thinkers, you know, over Cambridge, Oxford, places like that. Um, one, of them, uh, one of them, he's in Scotland now, you know, real devotee of Quine. Um, and then during my doctoral days, we had a, a head of department or what was then called a director of research, a director of the research cluster, um, who was ver very big into AJR, but also John McDowell. Um, the whole Pittsburgh school, you know, which kind of came out after uh, Wilfred Sellers, which sought to um, integrate a kind of Hegelianism and a Hegelian way of thinking into philosophy. And that um, really helped me in my doctoral studies because I was writing on uh, realism within a post-Kantian world. It was comparing Aquinas and Kant and trying to defend a form of Thomistic realism against Kant. So John McDowell was, uh, and, and Sellers uh, were big influences on me and, you know, come to terms with these issues because they themselves arguably were, you know, presenting a, a kind of post-Kantian uh, realism or a, a post-Kantian way of defending the view that uh, my thoughts about the world as thus and so um, are a result of the world's being thus and so, something like that. Uh, and so that was, that was really influential and I wouldn't have had that kind of influence unless we had that real strong analytic strain within the department. And we had that particular director of research who, you know, had engaged with McDowell and done an awful lot of work on McDowell. So um, that, that was more or less my intellectual upbringing. So it's always been conversant with analytic philosophy and philosophy and scholastic tradition. The only tradition that it hasn't been conversant on um, has been the phenomenological or the, the, what's called the continental tradition. Um, that took some real effort on my part to just to engage with that on, on my own. Um, and basically, the way I engaged with that was um, when I was working at Queen's, just, you know, do, as an adjunct lecturer, doing lectures here and there, I would get together for, you know, a, a reading group, you know, with a retired lecturer from philosophy of science. And um, we sat and we read Heidegger's Being in Time and Sartre's Being in Nothingness and the various other little pieces that these guys had um, published over the course of five or six years, really close in-depth readings, you know, which gave me a good solid kind of grasp of the, some of the major issues within the phenomenological tradition. And so um, after a while, you know, I, I, I came to incorporate some of that into my thinking, especially, you know, Heidegger and my thinking, well, the early Heidegger and my thinking about metaphysics and, uh, and the being of beings. So 
yeah, that's more or less my, uh, you know, intellectual upbringing. Obviously, you know, the scholastic end of things with Aquinas and, you know, that, that interest, but that just kind of, you know, situates, you know, my engagement with analytic philosophy and how the, uh, the continental or phenomenological tradition crept in there. All right. And, you know, I was really happy hearing you talk about, um, you know, like you, you were diving into uh, phenomenology, right? And then Stephen <laughs> kind of compliments you in that regard. So, Stephen, take it away. Well, uh, my background is in analytic philosophy. My I have a four-year degree in philosophy from Arizona State University, and analytic philosophy is what the majority of people who work there uh, teach. So I, I have that familiarity with philosophy, and certainly like my first philosophical interests were in analytic philosophy. Um, <clears throat> in 2017, I began my PhD in theology at Fuller Theological Seminary, and I study with Dr. Oliver Crisp, who is one of the leading figures in the so-called analytic theology movement. Uh, and I was studying with other students of Oliver's as well as some postdocs that were associated with him. He received a $2 million grant from the Templeton Foundation, I think in 2015 or so, to begin you know, this three-year research period on analytic theology. Uh, so everybody was working in analytic theology. Almost everybody who I was working with then had some kind of background in analytic philosophy. And that was typically the method that they used to approach their theological investigations. Um, about that same time, I began to move away from analytic philosophy towards phenomenology as, on the result of, as a result of my own independent studies. So I, I don't have a formal background in phenomenology, but I teach myself, I suppose, by reading Husserl or Heidegger or, or Merleau-Ponty or others. Um, Sokolowski especially was very influential for me because he makes what can be often very abstruse and difficult concepts in phenomenology to be quite accessible. Um, and also, interestingly enough, Sokolowski has some kind of a connection with Thomism, being a Roman Catholic and a priest. He, he talks in, at the end of his book, Introduction to Phenomenology, about the relationship between phenomenology and Thomism. Um, so, my, so I would say that, you know, if I don't know that I succeed to be anything or anything, but what I try to be anyway in my, in my writing is something of a phenomenologist. Uh, so I, even though my background is in analytic philosophy, I don't say that I do analytic philosophy per se, even though, you know, distinct analytic influences might be perceptible in my work. Um, and my dissertation at uh, Fuller is called The Constructive Theological Phenomenology of Scripture. Uh, so the things that like I typically write about and talk about on Facebook are really not connected to my dissertation. <laughs> I'm, I, like to, I like to take part in the polemics and the debates about classical theism. And I, uh, I'm glad that we're doing this talk because I think that one of the things that really slows down the discussions about classical theism and Thomism in particular uh, is precisely the fact that so many people are approaching Thomism and classical theism more generally from an analytic perspective, whereas these traditions did not grow up in the, you know, in the world of analytic philosophy. And it's very difficult to make some of the notions intelligible to people whose only background is in analytic philosophy. So I think that this is a really great uh, topic for conversation, and I'm looking forward to seeing, you know, what we can, uh, what, you know, what fruit will be borne by the, by the discussion as it goes on. All right. Well, then let's uh, dive right into some of the questions that we have here. Um, but actually, um, just to describe why uh, I wanted to do this video real quick, I, I think one time I uh, messaged Stephen and I, you know, we were talking about a friend of ours and I said, you know, I'm wondering why this friend of ours just has, you know, so many objections to classical theism. And is there a way for us to just like reach him, you know, because it seemed as if there was this growing chasm right, where we were trying to talk, but then it seems as if we're talking past each other, or maybe one side wasn't understanding the other. And then Stephen said, yeah, I mean, that's what analytic philosophy will do, or something like that, right? So I think it's really worth talking about the frameworks in which we reason, and how this shapes the debate on classical theism. Because I've noticed, too, that, you know, if someone has a particular kind of um, framework through which they see everything, and then you try to introduce something new, then the concepts might not even stick on the other person's, you know, understanding. So let's just start off by talking about what is analytic philosophy. Uh, and maybe I'll have Gavin go first and then Stephen. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, I've been thinking about this, you know, quite a bit. I've been thinking about it for years, actually, you know, having done a degree, you know, half of which was in analytic philosophy, just thinking about what exactly analytic philosophy is. And it's, it's a really odd sort of beast analytic philosophy, and, and I don't mean beast in any sort of pejorative way, you know, it, it's just a really odd phenomenon. And it's because 
for any definition that you give of analytic philosophy, you will get a self-professed analytic philosopher saying, no, that's wrong. That's not what analytic philosophy is. That's not what I'm doing. And um, you, there, there, there's two ways that you could go about this. You could talk about the analytic tradition in philosophy. So working within a, a particular tradition with a number of canonical thinkers and you see yourself as an inheriting their way of philosophizing, a certain way of doing things. So there's not a commitment to a set of doctrines or a set of views. You know the way in, in German idealism, let's say, or in, or in Kantianism or in, or in a school of philosophy devoted to a particular thinker, you will get certain uh, major themes that if you don't really sort of deal with them or subscribe to them, you can't really be called a thinker of that tradition. So in Thomism, for instance, I mean, the, the big thing in Thomistic metaphysics is distinction of essence and existence, something like that. You're not really a Thomistic metaphysician or you're not really doing Thomistic metaph metaphysics unless you guess, uh, engage with that issue and the associated issues of the nature of essence, nature of existence, causality, act, potency, all that sort of stuff. It's hard to see how one could be a Thomistic metaphysician if one didn't do that. Similar things for, you know, if you're a Kantian in the Kantian tradition or if you're a Humean or whatever. The funny thing about analytic philosophy is that there's nothing like that in analytic philosophy. Um, or so, so one way of thinking about it goes, there, there's just a tradition of philosophy where we have these, you know, canonical, you know, benighted thinkers such as, you know, Russell, Quine, Wittgenstein, Frege, for instance. But then you have their, you know, sort of the, their students and their grand students who have um, really just moved away from, from their ways of philosophizing. There was a turning really in analytic philosophy after the 1950s or 60s when that, that's, that sort of generation of early analytic philosophers, you know, were, were surpassed by their students and then by their grand students. And all sorts of, you know, weird and wonderful uh, views started to creep in, which, you know, the originators, the pioneers of the analytic movement, um, wouldn't really take to, would have repudiated, in fact. So that's one way to kind of think about analytic philosophy. Well, it's continuing a tradition which has its roots in Frege, Russell, Wittgenstein, and all those other key thinkers. Another way to think about analytic philosophy is as um, a, a particular kind of philosophy which is committed to certain doctrinal elements. And, and this is Michael Dummett's way of thinking about um, analytic philosophy in, the, in that book of his, The Origins of Analytic Philosophy. He thinks that the central philosophical problem problematic in contemporary philosophy, well, in the 19th century, is the problem of meaning. How our thoughts, you know, can be significant um, how, uh, and meaningful. And he thinks that there was a major breakthrough in that when it came to Frege, that the way to analyze the meaningfulness and significance of thoughts is to analyze language. So the philosophy of language then became the all important um, demarcating factor between the kind of philosophy that Frege and then those following him were doing and the sort of philosophy, well, that Husserl was doing, the more phenomenological philosophy. And so Dummett thinks that Frege marks a particular sort of strand in the history of philosophy, which goes a certain way and develops into analytic philosophy. So the analysis of language and the consideration of meaning and the significance of our thought in terms of the analysis of language seems to be an essential feature of analytic philosophy. And then what Frege does is he talks about analytic philosophy as pertaining to that, the analysis of language, and then philosophers within the analytic tradition who work on the back of those philosophers who are doing analytic philosophy. So if you get analytic philosophers today who maybe don't think analytic philosophy is, pertains to the philosophy of language essentially, that the philosophy of language is one essential component of analytic, or, or one major component of analytic philosophy, but it's not the essential component. Well then, Dummett would sort of um, locate them within the, the analytic tradition, but he wouldn't really think that they are doing analytic philosophy. That's another way to go about, about it. My own sort of thinking is that um, historically we're much too close to um, analytic philosophy to determine it. Um, that, that, that's one thing. We talk about scholasticism and scholastic philosophy, and I think we can do that because there's a definite um, mark in the history of philosophy where scholasticism has kind of come to a halt and we've got a new way of philosophizing. And this is with Francis Bacon and Descartes and, and the whole sort of desire to rebuild philosophy anew and start again. So you see that we're, end of the, we're at the end of the scholastic period there and the philosophy of scholasticism and we're in the new sort of period. So we can look objectively at scholasticism and say what it is. We don't have that with analytic philosophy yet. 
um, at least it's too early to say that we have that because we still have um, self-professed analytic philosophers um, saying that they're doing analytic philosophy. What it is they're actually, they're actually doing, I'm not too sure because it seems that unless you go down the dominant line that there is some sort of you know, common doctrinal content to analytic philosophy, all it seems to be that they're doing is that they're self-professed analytic philosophers interested in particular issues. And those issues are issues of analytic philosophy because they take themselves to be analytic philosophers. So the philosophy gets its signification from its practitioners. Its practitioners aren't analytic philosophers because of the philosophy that they're doing. The philosophy is characterized as so because they take themselves to be analytic philosophers. That's what it seems to me in, in the more sort of contemporary situation of analytic philosophy in the 21st century. Also, when we talk about doing um, philosophy within a particular tradition, say scholastic philosophy, there isn't really anything which is characteristic of scholastic philosophy. There's nothing which we could say, you know, this is scholastic philosophy. All there is is um, a particular conglomeration of different scholastic philosophers, and you do philosophy sort of within that school, say within the school of Aquinas or Scotus or Albert or something like that. These are all significant scholastic philosophers, and scholasticism in a way sort of comprises these thinkers, and it's it, it's not a neat it's not neat around the edges. You know, you, you get in the gray area when you get into later philosophers or, or you know thinkers who really diverge from those major scholastic philosophers like somebody like John Buridan or some of the late medieval nominalists who are emerging into the modern period of philosophy. So um, within scholasticism, let's say, there's no such thing really as scholastic philosophy. There's just, you know, the philosophy of these particular philosophers. Within the analytic tradition, you don't seem to have that. You don't have, you know, kind of like a Thomism or a Kantianism. Um, in an analytic philosophy, you know, I suppose you do have, you know, followers of Frege um, or followers of Quine, but they don't take themselves to be doing a kind of philosophy in the way that followers of Aquinas or Aristotle or Kant take themselves to be doing a particular kind of philosophy. They're more inspired by the insights of these thinkers and they're trying to kind of, you know, branch out on their own. So analytic philosophy, it seems to me, is characterized something like that that they have these canonical thinkers that uh, are taken to inspire them and they proceed to do work on philosophical issues which interest them and that work is taken to be analytic philosophy because they self-identify as analytic philosophers. So I suppose, I mean, I'll, I'll stop there. There's a few other wee things um, I could say, but I'll stop there. Maybe let Stephen come in, see if he has any thoughts on that. Yeah, sure. Uh, Stephen, what are your thoughts? Um, like Gavin said, there's a great difficulty about defining analytic philosophy. Uh, and this difficulty arises for a number of reasons. Um, on the one hand, analytic philosophy is typically contrasted to continental philosophy. Um, continental philosophy follows more in the, you know, in the footsteps of Kant. Uh, and then Husserl makes his own contribution to that debate. And then Heidegger, Merleau-Ponty, Sartre, others. Um, this is in, you know, Husserl is like the continental counterpart of Frege. Um, you know, Heidegger and these guys are like the counter, counter, continental counterparts of uh, Wittgenstein and um, uh, Bertrand Russell and other such figures. But at the end of the day, you know, the people will make the counter argument that you find analytic philosophers and continental philosophers, so-called continental philosophers, arguing for more or less the same thing, even if they use different language. So there is no like single, perhaps there, perhaps there is no single doctrinal or dogmatic or theoretic or whatever commitment that identifies an analytic philosopher as such. Um, in the world of analytic theology, this is one of the live problems. You know, what is exactly analytic theology supposed to be? How, how is it that this movement that calls itself analytic theology uh, distinguished from Bardian theology or reform theology or whatever? Uh, and a lot of analytic theologians will point out that we call ourselves analytic theology because we have some sort of affinity for analytic philosophy and we make use of the tools and methods of analytic philosophy in addressing theological questions. But it's also equally difficult to define analytic philosophy. Is there one set of tools that all analytic philosophers use? No. Uh, is there one like guiding doctrine of all analytic philosophers? No. There are just certain family resemblances among philosophers that uh, perhaps justify to some extent their co-labeling as analytic. Um, if I could venture a, um, a speculative proposal, one thing that does characterize analytic philosophy as such 
is that it is philosophy, and here I'm gonna inevitably use phenomenological language, it is philosophy that is done within the so-called natural attitude. Um, and the, you know, phenomenology makes a distinction between the, the natural attitude and the phenomenological or transcendental attitude. In the natural attitude, basically the, the basic supposition of the natural attitude is that you think of subject and object as like harsh and distinct. I am a subject, the computer in front of me is an object, uh, and basically I'm thinking about the object itself uh, simply as a subject, as a kind of a bare subject that has access to the object. This is like the naive realism of the natural attitude. When you talk to people on the street, they just walk around uh, and you say, what is that thing over there? And they'll say, oh, that's a tree. Do you see the tree? Yeah, I see the tree. It's right there, the whole tree. Um, the phenomenological attitude is something different. In the phenomenological attitude, we no longer think of subject and object as discrete, you know, separate entities. We think of them in correlation to one another. So whereas the man on the street says that he sees a, a tree, simply the whole tree, the phenomenologist will say, no, from within the phenomenological attitude, what you see, strictly speaking, is the tree as it is visible from a certain perspective, you know, given your own, you know, cognitive endowments and apparatus and, and way of thinking, etc. So now the appearance is not simply of an object to a, a subject, the subject being understood as a kind of a screen. Uh, rather, the subject and the object together contribute to the appearance. So what, you, so what I see when I'm looking at you, for example, is not simply my computer, but my computer in certain conditions of lighting, you know, as I see them through my eyes, you know, assisted by my glasses, given the fact that I know what a computer is and I can see it and I can constitute it as a computer and so on. So the, the phenomenological attitude, of course I can't explain it in five minutes, but the, the basic idea is that the phenomenological attitude is a way of thinking about the world such that subject and object are put in correlation with one another. The appearing object and the subject to whom it appears are seen as somehow correlated with one another rather than as just two distinct things. Um, almost all analytic philosophy, if not all of it, takes place within the natural attitude. Um, we think simply about the essence of free will. What is free will? Well, if we're going to give a phenomenological answer to that question, we can't simply answer what is free will. We have to ask what is free will to us? Uh, if we're going to think about what is the mind, you know, we cannot simply think about the mind in terms of like brain activity or something like that. That's a, that's a natural attitude answer. The mind is a brain, an object that's out there that we can study and so on. If we're going to do phenomenology, we have to think, what is the mind according to us, right? As we experience having a mind and as we experience consciousness and so on. I would say that, and maybe Gavin can contradict me if he thinks that I'm mistaken. I would, I would say that analytic philosophy almost by default takes place within the natural attitude. Once you recognize the distinction between the natural attitude and the phenomenological attitude, then you're no longer an analytic, you're a phenomenologist. Uh, and Husserl himself said this, you cannot become a phenomenologist, right, without engaging in what's called the epoche and, and uh, you know, uh, exceeding to the, to the phenomenological attitude. Apart from that, there is no phenomenology. Um, and I think that one of the reasons why phenomenology is so difficult for um, analytic philosophers to understand is precisely because they have not yet you know, accomplish this jump from the natural to the phenomenological attitude. They don't know how to see things in that way. And a lot of phenomenologists have, phenomenologists have written about this. Um, Hedwig Conrad Martius, for example, has this line, I just quoted it on Facebook recently, that says, in order to be a phenomenologist, the scales have to fall off your eyes. Something has to happen. You have to learn how to gain a new perspective on things. And once you do that, however it happens, then you begin to see things differently and you notice a lot of things that simply go unnoticed from within the natural attitude. So if I could make a proposal, about what constitutes analytic philosophy as such. This would be my speculative proposal, again, with, with an inevitable air of, of polemic because I am a phenomenologist. Uh, I would say that analytic philosophy, philosophy is, is philosophy done from within the natural attitude and not from within the phenomenological attitude. Um, but you know, that's, that's, my, uh, that's my suggestion. So Alan, I have a thought on that, what Stephen just said. Could I maybe say a few words on that? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's, a, that, that's good to bear in mind, that distinction between the natural attitude and the phenomenological attitude. And I think you do get in a lot of analytic philosophy, especially the first sort of half of the 20th century, an awful lot of uh, thinking which is within the natural attitude. And then that has been inherited, um, you know, right up into the late 20th century and the early 21st century. And this kind of speaks to the point that I was making that, um, uh, within the analytic tradition, there are philosophers who are considered analytic philosophers, but they're doing they're, they're doing a kind of philosophy which a lot of other anal self-proclaimed analytic analytical philosophers would repudiate, uh, and that's because there are in fact a number of you know sort of 
central analytic philosophers who are doing philosophy in what you could call the phenom with the phenom phenomenological attitude. And I'm thinking of philosophers which are, you know, highly influenced by Kant uh, and by German idealism and by Hegelianism as well. You know, who, remember Hegel was the big enemy of, you know, the, the, the early analytic philosophers. But now uh, through the Pittsburgh School, through Sellers, Brandon and McDowell, um, you know, he, you know, the influence of Hegel is really, you know, making a mark. Um, through, uh, through Strawson, Kant was able to return uh, to, to a position of eminence in philosophy. Um, Strawson's book, The Bounds of Sense, where he incorporated uh, Kantian insights. And now, you know, Kant is, you know, taken to have a very honorable place in analytic philosophy. And with the influence of these German idealist thinkers, what you start to notice in analytic circles is a recognition that mind and world aren't conceived of in what you could call Cartesian kind of paradigm. Um, and I call it the Cartesian paradigm because it's, it's, the, it's the natural attitude kind of paradigm, as you call it, the subject and object paradigm. Um, there's this epistemic chasm between the two of them, and some sort of bridge has to be built, either through, whether through representations, through you know, some sort of sense data, you know, empirical counterparts, whatever it is. There has to be some sort of bridge built between mind and world. And one of the things that the German idealist tradition re really brought into um, uh, the, the analytic tradition is this idea that um, our engagements with objects in the world is a conceptual engagement, that objects in the world bring conceptual capacities into the operation, that our, our experience of objects isn't just the, the taking in of uh, sort of blank or naked data, that's, you know, that's the myth of the given, rather it, it brings into operation or brings into awareness uh, certain, you know, conceptual capacities that we have as rational individuals and we respond to our experiences within the world. With that in place then, um, all of our experience, all, our, all of our perception is conceptually loaded. There is no non-conceptual experience. And so knowing is not, you know, some sort of, you know, just sort of ostensive pointing at this or that in the world and trying to give the least subjective and most objective account of what knowing is, whatever the phenomenon is that we're trying to know, rather what it is is, you know, sellers, you know, use that phrase, it's standing in the space of reasons, you know, uh, knowing has to be rationally justified, not just causally justified by inputs from, from sensory experience. So sensation has to give some sort of a rational input to knowledge and not just a causal input. And, and that's something which is highly prominent within the analytic tradition, especially in the second half of the 20th century. Uh, and the reason why I bring that up is because it kind of speaks to the point that I was making, that whilst you see, you know, on the one hand, you, you see an awful lot of that natural attitude but then on the other hand, you're seeing these, you know, important analytical thinkers, you know, repudiating that natural attitude and embracing the phenomenological attitude, an attitude which is found not only in Kant and Hegel, but also in Husserl, who is... ...philosophizing in analytic philosophy. Um, what, what you seem to have these days are self-identified analytic philosophers who find different ways of philosophizing appealing. Uh, for my part, I think, you know, we just have philosophers doing philosophy and why they want to identify themselves as analytic philosophers, I'm not sure. I don't know what the prestige is behind that, but they seem to just be doing philosophy and uh, the, the, they're finding stuff of interest in the likes of Husserl, Hegel, Kant, and and all the rest who don't sort of you know naturally sit within the uh, the analytic philosophy as it's taken you know from Frege, Russell, Wittgenstein, and those earlier thinkers. And well, I don't think that. So once again, there are no essential dogmatic or methodological commitments to analytic philosophy. So it's also possible that an analytic philosopher do phenomenology even if he doesn't recognize what this is going on. And it's also, you know, perfectly possible that people enter into the phenomenological attitude in everyday life, just ordinary mm. hoi polloi, without realizing that they're doing ph phenomenology. So, yeah. for example, this happens when you, you assume that, you know, you know what a text means and you read it. And then when you encounter an alternative interpretation of the text and you can see that it, it also makes sense of the text, just like yours does, then you're, you're, you're in the phenomenological attitude at that point. You're not simply seeing the text as a bare object, which just discloses all of its properties to you and you just take them in, you see mm -hmm. also the contribution that your own consciousness makes to the meaning of the, of the text. 
you see that when you come at it with your own assumptions, this is the meaning that suggests itself. When another mm -hmm. person comes at it with different assumptions, uh, a different meaning suggests itself. So it's possible for people to enter into the phenomenological attitude without being phenomenologists in a, in a sort of a self-assumed and, and you know, mm -hmm. uh, intentional way. And that mm -hmm. also can happen for analytic philosophers. They have you mm -hmm. know, moments in which the light turns on and they see things from within the phenomenological attitude and then they allow that to influence their philosophizing without themselves being phenomenologists in this intentional and, and uh, mm -hmm. in an intentional way as, uh, as of an assumed identity. So I, yeah. I, I, tend, to, I tend to agree with you. I, mm -hmm. think that the dis I think that your discussion is quite good. Yeah, I think and that, um, uh, so, I mean, we've kind of already gotten into the second question, so let me just make it more fine-tuned, and then we can continue with the conversation we have, right? So the second question was just basically, um, what are the limits of analytic philosophy that are basically available for everyone to see? And I think that um, when, I, when I mean available for everyone to see, I'm talking about people who aren't necessarily classical theists, right? But, you know, people from different camps or even people within the analytic tradition, as Stephen has pointed out. Um, hmm. So, Gavin, uh, I'd love to hear yeah. your thoughts on this and just continue what we have so far, and then we'll get into yeah. classical theism. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, anything that, any sort of limitations that I'll suggest to analytic philosophy um, has to be taken with the qualification that there's always going to be some analytic philosopher uh, or somebody who, you know, identifies as an analytic philosopher uh, who, who states, well, you know, this isn't what I do. And, you know, the obvious question then is, well, how is what you're doing analytic philosophy? Can you tell me what analytic philosophy is? And that sort of reverts back to the original point that it's very difficult to find, to get an analytic philosopher committed to what analytic philosophy is. So that, that's just the first qualification. But um, I suppose in thinking of the general limitations of analytic philosophy, um, one of the things that we need to talk about with analytic philosophy is the commitment to logic, okay, and the primacy that logic is accorded within analytic philosophy. And logic for the philosopher, logic has to be essential for every philosopher. Anybody who does philosophy, they have to do logic. I'm sorry, I'm just going to say that. They have to do logic. Uh, you need to know your logic if you're doing philosophy. And God bless the analytic ph philosophers, at least the early analytic philosophers, they really hammered that, that point home. Now, the way in which they did it, historically speaking, they thought they were, you know, making all sorts of new and wonderful innovations in logic and in the philosophy of logic, which historians of logic, you know, have since pointed out, well, you know, maybe if you had a wee look at the history of philosophy and the history of logic, you know, there's there's kind of more to it than that, than, you know, some thinkers might have anticipated what you were getting at there. But nevertheless, you know, the, the early innovators in analytic philosophy, they, they really did, you know, sort of focus on logic and they put it front and center. Now, and that's brilliant. That's really good um, because I think every philosopher does have to, you know, really know his logic. And I say this as somebody who teaches logic, um, that, you know, that has to kind of be front and center. The problem, though, with logic in analytic philosophy and the role that it's given in analytic philosophy is that it seems to me that it's giving so much fundamental primacy that all other branches of philosophy are of service to logic. So rather than logic being of service to the various branches of philosophy, metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics, so logic then is of service to these different branches of philosophy. Let's say, you know, we're going to look at the nature of being or the being of things. And so we use logic as our method, you know, for guiding our reasoning there. So rather than logic of being of service to these other branches of philosophy, it seems to me that within analytic philosophy, um, these other branches of philosophy have to be of service to logic or they have to be derived from logic or from innovations in logic. So if you take somebody like Carnap, for instance, he's an extreme example. Um, for him, lo uh, logic is the fundamental, it's the ultimate branch of philosophy. And you know, all metaphysics goes out the window with you know, a proper logic and philosophical logic. Epistemological issues are settled on the basis of logic and ethical issues. Well, there are no ethical issues. You know, we don't do ethics on that account. Um, and, um, you know, that's that sort of Carnapian position. You know, you find that, you know, in, in a kind of an attenuated form um, in the work of Quine. Of course, Quine was, you know, a, you know, to my mind, a much more original thinker and a much more interesting thinker than Carnap was. But you still get that idea in Quine that logic is the fundamental branch of philosophy. And then we make use of logic in... Um, and doing whatever 
issues interest us in philosophy. Um, so, for example, you know, some, some sort of issue like ontological commitment, we take, you know, our best sciences or our best disciplines, which give us knowledge of the world. We um, regiment those in the language of uh, first order predicate logic, and then we figure out what our ontological commitments are, what sort of things need to exist in order for, you know, those uh, sciences or those best uh, kinds of knowledge to be true. And then that's how we just, that's how we do ontology. Even when we see the return of the metaphysicians in analytic philosophy, which we've seen in the second half of the 20th century. So with the work of Kripke and Plantinga, the idea that, you know, when we, when we look at trans world identity, and we so see that um, there, are, there, there, there are features of entities uh, that they would have in all possible worlds in which they exist, okay? So the classic example that Kripke, Kripke gives in, um, what's that one, Naming and Necessity, is um, Nixon. Um, in every possible world in which Nixon exists, he is Nixon. But it's not the case that in every possible world in which Nixon exists, he's the president of the United States. Um, so there are certain properties that Nixon has which allow us to designate him rigidly in all worlds in which he exists. And these then are these rigid designators, if we put those together, they're the essential properties and we're starting to see a return to essentialism now. But you notice that return to essentialism is derived from a philosophical logic which is trying to give an account of designation, how we designate entities in the world. That's what naming and necessity was about. It was a, it, it was a, it was a foray in the philosophical logic, which then uh, leads to a, a kind of essentialism, which is now seen to be acceptable um, a, a, by contemporary analytic philosophers. The only reason why that essentialism is acceptable is because it's derived from these developments which were made in quantified modal logic. Um, those, if those developments weren't made, that kind of essentialism would still not be acceptable unless one kind of moved outside the confines of analytic philosophy and had some other justification for essentialism, say in the way that, you know, something like Aquinas did, that if you, you know, you just look at the thing and, you know, it has some sort of form and definitional content to it. And, you know, we, we, we can, you know, designate the thing as it is in the world as a kind of thing, instead of, you know, this whole elaborate scheme of possible worlds. So even when we get the return of the metaphysicians, it's still metaphysics as of service to you know, logic as you know, absolutely fundamental. Um, I think that's a limitation of um, analytic philosophy, precisely because whilst um, analytic philosophy, whilst logic is an important consideration in any philosophy, and it has to be, and shame on any philosopher who doesn't take logic seriously, it always has to be of service to the more, um, how would you, meteor, branches of philosophy, the likes of your metaphysics, you know, get given an account of being or epistemology and account of how we know our ethics and a kind of uh, how, what the good life is and how we ought to act. And it just seems to me that um, analytic philosophy gets that the wrong way around. There's um, logic is really just, it, it's regimentation. It's marching on the spot. It doesn't get you anywhere. Metaphysics, epistemology and logic or, and, and ethics they get you places precisely because not only are you marching on the spot, but you're being sent off in a particular direction to find things out. Um, so there's just too much of a primacy to logic there, um, which I, I don't think it ought to have. That's one of the limitations, um, but maybe I'll throw it over to Stephen and he might, you know, have, I've got a few other limitations as well, but I'll hand it over to Stephen. So I would be curious to hear what other limitations you have to name because I, you, you more or less have named the one that I was going to identify. So I, right. I, I can give a couple of examples. So I'll, I'll, I'll give two limitations that I can uh, uh, claim for analytic philosophy, um, both as a classical theist and as a phenomenologist. I'll start with the limitation that a phenomenologist would make. Analytic philosophy is limited because it doesn't, you know, intentionally in any case teach you uh, to reflect from within the phenomenological attitude. The, the limitation you know, to the natural attitude is precisely a limitation. It's, it's, uh, it's not that the natural attitude is false. It's not that every conviction that we have in the, nat in the natural attitude is a false one, but they are naive and they are sort of unreflected. And in the phenomenological school of philosophy, the appropriate way to fine tune the convictions and the commitments that we have in the natural attitude is precisely by rising up to the, net, to the phenomenological attitude in which we no longer think of subject and object as discrete and you know, unconnected and in need of a bridge to, to connect them, like Gavin was saying. Uh, rather, we see them as correlated to each other. The object that appears is, an, is 
uh, an object that appears to me to this subject. And, and both of them have to be seen uh, with reference to each other. So one limitation of analytic philosophy is that it doesn't, you know, at least not intentionally teach you to, to reflect from within the phenomenological attitude. But I would say that, especially with respect to our discussion about classical theism, the great Satan of analytic philosophy is first order logic. Thinking about reality in terms of like a variable which is connected to a predicate and the predicate can be just about any you know, conceivable, consistent grammatical string of words. Um, that I think is the devil in terms, of, uh, in terms of the limits of analytic philosophy. And the reason why is this, it trains you to think of reality in terms of bare particulars which are somehow externally related to predicates uh, which stand in for properties. Uh, I, on the other hand, prior to my becoming a phenomenologist, but also especially afterwards, have been a committed constituent ontologist. And the relationship between the particular and its properties is not one that is adequately represented by, you know, there is an X such that F, X is F. Uh, that's simply not the appropriate way to understand the relation between the things proper in the first place, because there's no way in a single sentence to explain that a property is essential in predicate logic. You have to say that necessarily if X exists, then X is F. Right. So you have to you can't even just say that X is, a, you know, F is essential to X without uh, introducing these other things. Um, in the second place, uh, you cannot make an, a hard and fast distinction between those properties which are um, essentially constitutive of the thing, those properties which are, uh, you know, like uh, which belong to the thing and yet are not essential to it. For example, my being seated is a property that I have and it belongs to me. It's con somehow constituent of my being, but it's not essential to me. I can stand up. Uh, and then those properties which do not even belong to me per se, like my being to the left of a, of a bookshelf, for example, um, you know, if you're, you know, from my point of view. Uh, I think that the real problem is first order logic uh, and teaching people to think about things in those terms, teaching people to think about beings as sort of bare items, variables, which uh, are externally connected to properties rather than being themselves sort of intelligible structures, right? The, the, the components of which are themselves intelligible content, such as my humanity, my risibility, my temperament, my ethnic background, whatever it might be. Um, so I certainly, if, if Gavin has any thoughts on this, I would like to hear it. But I think that this, especially with respect to, to um, the discussion about classical theism, I think this is one of the big disservices that analytic philosophy does to people who try to approach the classical theistic tradition, is it teaches them, intentionally or not, to think about objects and their properties in ways which are simply foreign to the classical tradition and uh, which cannot make sense of the things that the classical tradition says about God. For example, if you say that God is pure actuality and that he does not have a multiplicity of properties, well then, according to, according to you know, first order logic, he's just a bare variable. He's just, you know, there is an X. That's all that there is. But that's obviously not what we mean by God. We don't mean that God is bare of any content. Rather, he is the infinity of being. Everything else is a limitation of the content that's in God, strictly speaking, as a participation in God's being. I don't have more content than God simply because I have a string of properties and he does not. Rather, if anything, I think it's uh, Barry Miller that gives this example. If I'm, if I'm mistaken, you can correct me. It's kind of like you take a sheet and you you know, you use a cookie cutter to like take out pieces of the, of the sheet of dough, right? My individual being is like a cookie cutter sampling of the fullness of being of God. But God doesn't have a multiplicity of properties, and I do. So I think that, I think that this um, first order logic is really the, the, the component of analytic philosophy that I think does or at least should cause allergies for classical theists and for persons of other philosophical traditions. Because it teaches you to think about objects and their properties in a way that is simply well, first, not phenomenologically justifiable, and second, you know, ontologically problematic in the, in the utmost, especially when we talk about God. Mm. Yeah, um, I'm glad that you brought up first order predicate logic um, because it, it relates to the second and third uh, of the general limitations of analytic philosophy that I had in mind. Um, you know, first order predicate logic, it's, it's a lot of fun just doing it, you know, in the textbook and doing the, de the deductions, you know, whenever it's connected up with uh, the propositional calculus. But then when you actually start to think about reality in that way, uh, as you point out, you start to get issues. Um, and, you know, the first issue that I think is a bit of a problem is the, the analytic account of existence. Um, to be is to be the value of a bound variable. That's one classic 
analytic account of existence. I think that's a direct quote from Quine and on what there is to be is to be a value of a bound variable. And then Frege, um, you know, existence is the denial of the number zero. Um, so, I mean, there's a very strong analytic account of philosophy which holds that um, existence is nothing other than a second order predicate applicable to first order predicates. Um, so existence then is, um, there, there's nothing real or metaphysically important to existence. Rather, the, the meaty sort of stuff uh, or the engaging stuff is uh, the properties that the thing has. Um, that's what we engage with when we do metaphysics and what the actual thing is. We do not know. It's just this sort of blank which we to which we attribute properties. So you don't get a sort of very good count of existence there. And I mean, especially for the Thomist, you get no account of existence there because for Thomas, you know, existence is the act of all acts, you know, essay. The act of all acts of the thing without which the thing would be nothing. You wouldn't, you wouldn't even have an object there which could instantiate properties unless that object had essay or the act of existence. And this is one of the criticisms that I make of that account of existence in my 2015 book. Now, there are other accounts of existence as well, you know, from David Lewis and um, Nathan Salmon, and then you've got your, our contemporary actualists, the likes of uh, Robert Adams, who have, you know, these other, these different accounts of existence. But it seems to me that when they are trying to give an account of existence, they're not trying to understand existence phenomenologically in terms of you know, what existence is. Rather, they're trying to understand existence in terms of something else, something which isn't existence. So they're either trying to understand the existence in terms of you know, first order predicate logic, or they're trying to understand it in terms of you know, uh, being indexed to possible worlds, that's Lewis and Salmon, or they're trying to understand existence in terms of obtaining, obtaining in some of, you know, many possible, or one of many possible worlds, that's, that's our actualists. And so existence for our actualists is just that, you know, it happens to be true, or, you know, it obtains or is instantiated or something like that. None of them try to think through existence in terms of existence itself, but they always try to think, think it through in terms of something other than existence. And this for me is a problem because um, for, for the Thomist, Existence is the act of all acts. There is nothing without existence. And so nothing then is intelligible unless it's rooted in existence. So you can't come to terms with existence by means of something other than existence because everything else has its actuality and thus intelligibility because of existence. So you kind of just have to think your way into the nature of existence the way the phenomenologist does, um, rather than trying to get a handle on existence by something which is other than existence and receives its intelligibility from existence. So there's a, there's a limitation here in analytic philosophy that it's, I don't think it's able to climb out um, of, of its, its various commitments to give an account of existence. Um, but also, and this relates to um, that image you had of, you know, the cookie cutter notion of existence, that it's as if existence is just this, you know, sort of big, you know, sheet of cookie dough, and every individual is just cut out of that, and, you know, the, the shapes may be different, you know, but it's all really more or less the same. And this is because it seems to me that analytic philosophy, in giving an account of existence, wants to give you nivical a kind of existence, an account of existence which has the same meaning and signification for every existent that we have. It seems to me that analytic philosophy can't think um, in a way that what, what Thomas and the Aristotelians would call in an analogical fashion, that the reality signified can be the same in various different instances, but its mode of signification can be different. And so you can have a, you know, a analogical predication. It seems to me that there's no analogical way of thinking within analytic philosophy. You either have pure university and you get that, you know, you know, to be is to be the value of a bound variable, the, 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 the cookie dough view of existence. And so you, you just have that pure university or you have complete equivocity. But you can't have equivocity for existence because, you know, equivocity is when you have complete difference in signification, complete difference in meaning. So what's other than existence? Well, it's non-existence. So all you're left with is a uh, univocity. So it seems that analytical philosophers tend to go with univocal accounts of existence and, and they can't envisage anything else. And I think that's because, um, well, they, they take logic to have this supreme and utmost primacy that any account of existence has to be derived from you could call them the clear and distinct ideas of logic, the, the, the univocal uh, ideas within logic, and um, no account of existence can uh, 
go beyond that. So we're just left with this one and one only account of existence. And that just doesn't do justice to, you know, what, what you're calling the phenomenological um, attitude or the phenomenological view of things, of looking at things and seeing their metaphysical components and analyzing them in terms of how they are in themselves rather than within the context of some, you know, determined, you know, logical scheme or something else which is taken to be, you know, more intelligible, more tractable than the actual thing itself that we're considering. How does that sound? I like what you say, Gavin. I like it a lot. Um, I think we may have some minor disagreements on the matter of the analogy of existence, but those things may come up later. Um, but I, 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 think that you're, I think that you do something very good uh, when you say that analytic philosophy tries to think of existence in terms of something else rather than in terms of itself. Um, mm. And, you know, this corresponds very nicely with the, the sort of the, you know, methodological motto of phenomenological philosophy, which is to the things themselves. Yeah, uh, if you yeah. want to talk about anything, <laughs> if you want to philosophize about anything, you don't think about that thing with reference to something else. You return mm. to the things themselves. You return to where you encounter that thing in conscious experience and you limit your description. It's not speculative. You're not proposing hypotheses about what existence might be or speculative mm. proposals. You are simply attending to the way in which mm. the phenomenon in question reveals itself in experience and trying to identify um, mm. you know, by means of uh, imaginative variation and the other techniques that Husserl teaches, the essence of that thing, right? Yeah. So if, if there is a, an essence of a material body, right? What is mm -hmm. every material body has extension in space, has a shape, has whatever, blah, blah, blah. And you know this because you attend to the way material bodies reveal themselves to you, dispose themselves to you in an experience, and you try to identify those features of those, um, uh, you know, phenomena, which you could not lose without losing the phenomena itself, right? Mm -hmm. So some material bodies reveal themselves to me in Phoenix, Arizona, but they could also reveal themselves to me in Ireland or in Texas or in Romania or wherever. So it's not essential to a material body that it be here, but it is essential to a material body that it have shape and size and that it have like three dimensions and so on. Um, so the, the idea in phenomenology is that you, you don't speculate, you don't propose hypotheses, you don't engage in like, you know, this sort of like quasi scientific reasoning, you simply attend to the thing, you know, within the limitations of its disclosure and experience. And that is exactly what does not go on in philo analytic philosophical discussions about existence. You have this notion that ex existence is a second order predicate. Um, existence is itself a property that some things have and some things don't, right? I think that this is all nonsense. It's clear that existence is not a property because the, to say that a thing exists is not to give um, an intelligible content in the way that you, you, you would when you say that it's red or when you say that it's um, you know, a, a, a cat or a dog. Existence is not a part of the intelligibility of a thing. Existence is some added condition which provides the thing there to be known, right? But the intelligibility is what we might call the essence or the quiddity, right? So there's a distinction between essence and existence and quiddity in classical, uh, like Thomistic or scholastic philosophy. And you can't get this in analytic philosophy. It's blind to this. Um, a, you know, a, a common Facebook friend of ours told me that one of the things that seems to characterize analytic philosophy is precisely this forgetfulness of being that, that Heidegger decries. It, it, it sort of like ignores existence, it, for, it ignores being, and it, it, it doesn't have the right attention or the right attitude to understand being on its own terms. It tries to think of everything else except for being, or to reduce being to some other thing, like a property. Um, yeah, yeah. I think that that's all confused. Uh, and I think that that's one of the big issues in um, the discussion about analytic philosophy and classical theism, precisely because they don't, the way of seeing things in, in analytic philosophy is skewed. You, see thing, you don't see things on their own terms. You don't see things precisely as they are. You might even be skeptical of the notion that you can see things precisely as it is, uh, which is, of course, an anti-phenomenological stance. Um, so you begin to think about it in, in terms of other categories, existence as a property, existence as a second order predicate, whatever. Uh, and then you run into all kinds of problems, and it turns out that you can't understand classical theism and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. There, I mean, there's some other limitations of, of analytic philosophy and they sort of came up. Um, but uh, what, one of the general things that you find in analytic philosophy is if you do articulate a position, which doesn't fit, like we're saying, which, which doesn't fit into the categories of analytic philosophy and you know, requires more of a phenomenological um, attitude, the immediate response, uh, you know, from, you know, say an interlocutor on analytic philosophy is, uh, well, I don't understand what you mean by that. And, I mean, that's not so much a problem for, say, the Thomas position or the phenomenological position that somebody engaging with it doesn't understand it. That doesn't mean that 
the position is intelligible, that might mean that you know one needs to move to a more phenomenological way of thinking. Um, but it, it seems to me that um, maybe it's kind of you know broad brushstrokes that analytic philosophers take you know the kind of philosophy that they do or the kind of philosophy that they find intelligible to be philosophy per se, and then everything else needs to sort of measure up to that. And I think maybe that attitude is a bit of a historical hangover from the, the, the more sort of fiercer, fiercer divisions between the analytics and the continentals where, you know, continental philosophy was dismissed as not even being philosophy at all. Um, and I think maybe that's just a bit of a historical hangover from that sort of situation. But it, it, I mean, I think this is a limitation, you know, of um, some strands of analytic philosophy that it would see itself as, you know, philosophy per se. And so if anything has to be philosophical, it has to measure up to that. Uh, maybe you get that with those who are more kind of, you know, prone to the, the logical positivist uh, strain of analytic philosophy or who have inherited that sort of attitude. I like what you say. I, you know, here's an interesting, I mean, everybody knows the analytic philosopher first time encountering like, you know, Thomism or scholastic philosophy or phenomenology or whatever it is. And says, I just don't understand what you guys are saying. Like, this is all nonsense. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, I recall uh, learning, you know, by way of anecdote with a friend of mine, a professor who actually has an interest in Thomism. He teaches in Romania in Cluj. And he was telling me that a, a famous Romanian intellectual, his, his name is Andrei Pleșu, was saying at one point that he just doesn't understand analytic philosophy. He, he, he tries to read it and he just does not understand what it's trying to say. Uh, <clears throat> so the problem of intelligibility works the other way around, too. Analytic philosophy mm -hmm. is unintelligible to some people. Um, yeah. And that's because... You know, analytic philosophy has its own language. There's also this possibility, which, uh, you know, perhaps you can comment on, or perhaps it's, it's not as interesting. Analytic philosophy is mostly written in English, and it's also possible that there are a lot of things that are possible within analytic philosophy only because they're possibilities of the English language. When you try to translate an analytic philosophy into a different language, like I have, for example, some translated some works from, from English into Romanian, it just doesn't translate. There are things you can, you can say in English that you can't say in Romanian or at least you can't get them across in the same way and you can't help but to sort of like, you know, lose some of the meaning or some of the sense um, when you, you know, when you translate into, into a different language. <clears throat> so it's also possible that a lot of the, the, the you know, the, the theoretical playground space of analytic philosophy is itself a, a contingent factor of the, the transformation of the English language. I think, for example, in analytic philosophy, you might have somebody, you know, seriously propose the idea that a contingent being you know, can exist without a cause, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. How can you even formulate that sentence in any other language? You, you could not possibly say that in, in Romanian and make any sense because the idea of contingency, right? It, it, you know, contingency means co-touching. <laughs> uh, something is contingent because it, it touches on something else. Uh, it's a contingency on the basis of what, it, what causes it. How can you have a contingent being without a, without a cause? It's, it's nonsense. Mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. you can't say that in English because in English, the sense of, uh, contingency, you know, this sort of etymological notion of contingency as co-touching is lost and contingent just now means possibly non-existent or something, right? It, mm -hmm. Again, it's been reduced to its logical function. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, these, 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 uh, these things which in analytic philosophy are intelligible to everybody talking, in other languages make no sense. And yeah. analytic yeah. philosophy itself is unintelligible to people who are raised in different languages and in different contexts. Yeah. And I think that's an important point about language because I think it works the other way because, I mean, you read Heidegger, Being in Time. Um, I mean, could Heidegger have, you know, written Being in Time without the German language and the manipulability of the German language and his ability to make neologisms and invent words the way one can do in German? You read the English translations of um, Heidegger's Being in Time and what we're just seeing is, you know, hyphenated words after hyphenated words after yeah. hyphenated words, the being there present at hand, you know, the being there ready to hand and, you know, stuff like that. It makes sense in German if you, if you can think in German and you can read German and you can see what he's doing with the language. Um, but outside of that, um, it doesn't make sense. And, and, and interesting, well, it, it eventually makes sense, but you have to think your way into it. Somebody who reads it first time might just think, you know, oh, well, this is just nonsense. This is unintelligible. So I'm not going to, you know, spend too much time with it. Interesting point, actually, which was, you know, um, brought up to me recently. I read Michael Friedman's book, The Parting of the Ways, um, on Carnap, Kassir, and Heidegger in the Davos Convention. Is that um, Kassir, or not Kassir, Carnap was quite familiar with Heidegger's being in time, and he was able to engage with uh, Heidegger's being in time and 
one of the reading groups that I was in, um, it was suggested to, to me that, you know, despite, you know, the philosophical differences um, going on between Carnap and Heidegger, the reason why Carnap was able to engage, you know, with Heidegger's thinking is because they were both working within a German post-Kantian way of thinking, where the language and the, the ideas and, and the problems which were uh, at issue um, were, were common to all of them. Uh, but it seems to me that, you know, after the, after the parting of the ways and after, um, you know, a lot of those logical positivists, you know, they, they, they move, you know, to, to the UK and they move to the States and they start writing in English. And, you know, you're already getting analytic philosophy being done in England and, you know, being done in parts of the States. It seems that, um, that there is this real division between philosophy as it's, as it's written in non-English languages and so can take different sort of routes and different things can be made intelligible and philosophy as it's written, you know, in English and thus becoming Anglo-American. And it seems that, you know, there's a kind of a, there's almost a hegemony of philosophy there uh, within that tradition that things are only expressible within a certain way. So when you try and, you know, give an account of, of the being of things or, you know, uh, not, not, not even, you know, in Thomism with essay and stuff like that, even if you try to make, you know, what Heidegger's project in being in time intelligible. Um, it just doesn't sit well um, with a, an analytically trained philosopher. And unless they're quite curious and patient and think to themselves, well, you know, there might be something in this, um, they'll, they'll just not be able to get the benefit of Heidegger or Husserl or, you know, any other philosopher for that matter. I think this is the, one of the big points. Analytic philosophy emphasizes clarity of expression and, and you know, like uh, making a clear argument and so on. But at the same time, it fails to recognize, again, because it is not phenomenological, it fails to recognize the contribution that it's bringing to the experience. It fails to recognize that an analytic philosophy is itself a language which has to be learned uh, in order for it to become intelligible. It's not simply intelligible of itself. No language is intelligible of itself. Um, mm -hmm. Romanian is intelligible to Romanian speakers. The more, the better you speak it, the more intelligible it can be. Uh, mm -hmm. English is speaking to, is intelligible to English speakers. And the more that you speak it, the better you can get at it. And if you can learn English and Romanian, then you can understand both of the languages. You can express yourself in Romanian, you can express yourself in English. Uh, you can express an idea in English, which would be more easily expressed in Romanian and vice versa. Analytic mm -hmm. philosophy is also itself a language. I had to learn you know, the language of analytic philosophy, it wasn't immediately intelligible to me, I had to figure it out. So also Thomism, scholastic philosophy is its own language. When you read, if, you know, if you or I were to pick up a, a Thomistic text, we could read it and understand it just fine. But if some of my professors from Arizona State picked up a Thomistic text and tried to read it, they would not have any idea what they're reading. They don't know what a specific difference is. They don't know what, you know, aquidity is and all these sorts of things. Uh, and the same also applies in the case of phenomenology. Analytic philosophy or at least people who are trained within analytic philosophy and who have minimal, if any, exposure to other philosophical traditions, learn to see other philosophical traditions as unintelligible, objectively unintelligible, and their own tradition as the, the, the paragon or the canon of intelligibility, when in fact it's just another language with its own limitations and its own strengths. There are things you can say in analytic philosophy very easily that you couldn't say in other traditions, but there are also things you can't say easily in analytic philosophy that you could say in other traditions. And you have to learn to see it as a language rather than simply as the way things are, right? You, mm. have, to, you have to see the contribution that doing analytic philosophy makes to the content of your, of your philosophical proposals and the way that it limits them uh, in mm. addition to the way that it, it makes them possible. Yeah. I'll let Gavin, uh, oh, sorry, I'll let Gavin respond. And then I think we can start moving on specifically to classical theism, if both yeah. of you are satisfied. And I also want to ask uh, maybe Stephen a question um, after Gavin makes his remarks. So Gavin, okay. make your remarks, Stephen, ask you a question, then we'll move on. Yeah, I, I think maybe just the last remark to make is just um, because we're really happy getting at analytical philosophy and, you know, analytical philosophers will be listening and thinking, well, hold on a minute, I don't do this, I don't do that. <laughs> Or whatever. I, I, I do think um, we have to make, you know, sort of two points is that, first of all, whilst it does take time and effort to learn the language of analytic philosophy, and, you know, it, it's not easy, no, no philosophical relation is easy to think one's way into, um, it's worth it. it. It is worth it to engage with analytic, analytical philosophy, and it is worth doing analytical philosophy. I know that um, my own sort of um, philosophical life would be much um, sort of less rich than what it is. It'd be much more meager uh, were it not for my engaging, you know, with the, the, the foundational thinkers of analytical philosophy, were it not for engaging with Sellers, Brandon, and McDowell, 
and you know other thinkers you know on the on the contemporary scene so so that's one point to make and the other point to make as well is that um we we, we do need to distinguish between an analytical philosopher who you know is, is trained within the analytical tradition but um because you know they are just doing philosophy and they are thinking philosophically they're not always doing what is typically the philosophy of that tradition that sometimes they are just doing philosophy and trying to engage in philosophy and it's, it's kind of a point of related to the start that the, the divisions are blurred and a lot of the times you know analytical philosophers will think you know well i'm an analytical philosopher and this interests me so you know, I'm doing analytical philosophy, you know, what, what more do you want when in fact what they're just doing is philosophy and, you know, in interest in issues in philosophy, but they're coming at it out of a background of analytic philosophy. I, th I think that's an important point that needs to be made. Yeah, I agree. And I would certainly underline the point that you made about the value of learning analytic philosophy. I think it is eminently valuable. Um, what I think is more problematic is a kind of a, you know, a kind of a, myopic or lazy or whatever uh, self-restriction to analytic philosophy as if analytic philosophy can solve all the problems or it only ha it has the only interesting things to say my own uh, my own experience in philosophy like you said has been greatly enriched by learning analytic philosophy and also familiarizing myself with other philosophical traditions even if later on i came to reject or to move beyond analytic philosophy as sort of like myself you know my my self-assumed identity uh, I still think it's very helpful for me to have started in analytic philosophy because I, or at least people tell me, I have the ability to make a phenomenological point, but in a way that is at least, you know, initially intelligible to somebody with no familiarity with uh, uh, phenomenology um, mm -hmm. or, a, you know, a classical theistic or scholastic point in, some, uh, in a way that is intelligible to somebody that doesn't have a prior familiarity with that language. So mm -hmm. I think actually what's really valuable, and this is ultimately the philosophical life, What's really valuable is to familiarize yourself with many different traditions and to learn many different ways of speaking and to, you know, in that same way, to gain the ability to say things with a greater precision, a greater clarity, a greater um, profundity, precisely by learning multiple languages and gaining the, the, the powers of expression from all those languages and combining them in some way. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So, Stephen, I actually, so I wanted to ask you, because you've emphasized the um, phenomenological standpoint, if maybe you know someone in the audience is wondering, okay, so I can see like from your perspective how you would have these problems with analytic philosophy. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you talk about why one should accept, or you know, what are good reasons for accepting this standpoint? Just under, uh, just justify right this perspective that you're introducing. Yeah. Um, well, Husserl talks about the so phenomenology basically the the beginnings of phenomenology were epistemological right how do we know what can we know this is one of the central questions in phenomenology and phenomenology functions on the basis of a, of a principle or really two principles one of them is the maxim a research maxim as 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 heidegger calls it to the things themselves if you want to know what existence is you have to consult existence if you want to know what a cat is you have to study cats if you want to know what free will is you have to consult free will right the idea is that we don't make speculative proposals we don't propose hypotheses we don't you know do anything like that we simply try to see what the thing is by it putting ourselves in the right position um, and the second point is what Husserl calls the principle of all principles and this idea is that um, I couldn't give you an exact formulation from his work um, but this comes up in uh, his book called ideas one uh, ideas for a pure phenomenology and a phenomenological philosophy or whatever it's called. Uh, the idea basically is this, that anything that can be justified on the basis of what's called an originary intuition in consciousness, we are, accept we are justified in accepting. So anything that is given in consciousness in a sort of an originating way, right? It's not mediated, simply this is just a given of consciousness. Um, anything that comes by way of consciousness in an original and, and unmediated and sort of default way, we, we are justified in accepting this. So, for example, in phenomenology, we are, accept, we are justified in accepting the data of our senses about the world, right? We don't have to build an argument for the reliability of our senses like Descartes does. Our senses are just one of the basic givens of our conscious life, and we're justified in accepting it because, of course, apart from consciousness, we don't have anything, right? If something is going to mean something to us, it has to be given to consciousness. And if something is not given to consciousness, we can't talk about it. It doesn't mean anything to us. Um, interestingly enough, Maurice Merleau-Ponty uh, references in a discussion about his uh, 
book, um, Phenomenology of, of uh, Perception, I think I it is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in a discussion about his book, which took place after it was published, he makes this point. He, he, he references Barclay's uh, master argument, right? I cannot even for an instant imagine an object in itself, right? Phenomenology rejects the notion of an object in itself. And the object in itself is like what Gavin was talking about, that bare X that we don't know what it is, uh, but to which we attach various properties, right? Which are perceptible to us, right? Like the, 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 the thing in itself in Kant, right? This uncognizable, unknowable noumenon, right? That does not appear to us itself, but what does appear to us are these phenomenal things once consciousness has you know, applied the transcendental categories on it and so on and so forth. Phenomenology rejects all that. There is nothing, you know, we don't admit anything that is not given to consciousness. Even if we think about it, if we can imagine it, it's already a given of consciousness, right? Uh, and that's Barclay's uh, point, right? You cannot imagine a thing that's unperceived because precisely by imagining it, you're perceiving it. So the idea in phenomenology is that we accept whatever is given to consciousness precisely as it's given, right? And we're justified in doing so because consciousness is our only source for anything. Uh, you know, whatever, uh, whatever else there might be, if it doesn't appear to consciousness, we can't talk about it. It doesn't mean anything to us. It doesn't affect us. Um, so uh, I would say that why should somebody accept phenomenology? Well, because phenomenology takes consciousness seriously as the source of knowledge. Whatever is given to consciousness in an originating and intuitive way, by intuitive, I don't mean that it makes sense. By intuitive, I mean that it like it's 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 a given. It's something that's given, just like your sense, you know, your sense perception is intuition in Kant, for example. But there are also other forms of intuition that Husserl recognizes. Um, everything that is given to consciousness in this original way uh, that we don't have to build our way up to it. It's not mediated. It's simply a given of consciousness. We're justified in accepting that. Um, so if you take consciousness seriously as the source of knowledge, then phenomenology, precisely as the study of conscious experience is seemingly the most reasonable way to engage in philosophy. And as you study it, you realize that although, you know, our natural attitude hits at the truth, I do really see a computer in front of me. I am really talking to you, uh, but phenomenological reflect reflection helps us to refine the insights that we gain and the truth that we gain through the natural attitude in a more precise way. Um, but basically, if somebody asks me, well, why should we be a phenomenologist? Well, because apart from consciousness, we have no other source to anything. We have no other way of talking about anything unless it's given to consciousness in some way. Um, and phenomenology provides a method, namely the phenomenological reduction for studying consciousness and what actually is given to consciousness and how it is given and so on. Hmm. Gavin, do you have anything to add to that or? Um, no, I mean, just that, you know, I, I, I like to, you know, the, the way Stephen drew out the discussion, I thought it was really cool. And um, I suppose that my attitude would be something similar, only the way I would attack things would be that the idea of a perceptual experience, which is, which is empty, which is without an object, is, a, is an impossibility. Um, I, don't, I don't think that one can have perceptual experience without an object of perception. So one of the conditions for the possibility of an experience um, is that there is an object which is experienced. So immediately then, if there is to be consciousness, and I mean, this is something that Sartre goes on about, there always must be an object of consciousness. It's not like you just have empty consciousness, you know, just kind of floating about there, uh, waiting for content to enter it. If you have consciousness, it's because it's been brought into operation um, by something other than consciousness. So it's a very anti-Cartesian sort of move there. And it seems to me that... Um, uh, in, in a lot of contemporary philosophy, that's just not adverted to. Um, but actually, I think it's it's one of the strengths of some contemporary analytical philosophers that they that they have recognized that more sort of Kantian transcendental turn. If you know what's the condition for the possibility of experience, that there there always has to be some sort of object uh, for without which uh, experience would be impossible. And uh, I, I think, I mean, again, this is blurring the, the boundaries. You know, when does such a philosopher who's thinking like that cease to be analytic? And when are they becoming more of a phenomenological sort of thinker? Like, I mean, you take somebody like Richard Rorty, Mind in the Mirror of Nature. Is he an analytic philosopher in that book? Or is he becoming a, a phenomenological philosopher? You know, it's hard to tell. You know, it's highly praised by people in the analytic tradition. But, you know, it's, it's very, much, very much runs counter to a lot of, you know, ways of thinking in analytic philosophy. All right, yeah, so agreed. let's move on then to actually applying a lot of our insights into the debate on classical theism. Uh, so 
a lot of people are going to wonder now, all right, so you've gone through all the limits of analytic philosophy to some extent, you, you've kind of dissect, uh, dissected it, right? But if we apply these insights into the debates on classical theism and the objections that a lot of people, uh, analytics have, right, to classical theism, what would we gain, right? How would this shape the debate? How would this illumine uh, people maybe on both sides? So maybe I'll have Stephen go first and then I'll have Gavin follow up. I wish you would have asked Gavin to go first because he always has the more insightful comments and I can just sort of piggyback and take inspiration oh, from oh, him. Do you want me to do that? But, I can... No, no, it's fine. I'll, I, I, won't, I won't chicken out. I'll take the challenge of being the first to say something. Um, one thing that I would say is, well, one of the points that I've made and I think that Gavin agreed with me is that uh, analytic philosophy is not philosophy simpliciter, right? It's a particular way of doing philosophy. It has its own language. It has its own limitations, its own strengths. Um, and it's possible that certain ideas in classical theism cannot be formulated very well or very easily or very clearly in analytic philosophy. Um, it's much easier to say that God is pure act, uh, you know, just with those two words, uh, than it is to say that, you know, there is an X such that, you know, X is A where A equals is pure actuality, right? And for any other possible property P, you know, X is not P. That's confusing. And it, it doesn't even really get the point across because actuality is not a property of God. It's not as if like, you know, God is an individual that has a property of being purely actual or anything like that. Uh, God is pure actuality. He is the, you know, subsistent being itself. Um, so you you know, trying to take this idea and formulating and to formulate it in the sort of standard ways of analytic philosophy actually destroys the idea rather than communicating it. Um, I think that one thing that has to be recognized here is that analytic philosophy is not just philosophy simpliciter. It is a specific way of doing philosophy, making use of specific tools and a certain training. Um, and it seems to me that that training falls short when it comes to the task of reflecting carefully on you know, central philosophical commitments of competing traditions. And I think the, the unfortunate sad truth is that classical theism is born out of an alternative way of doing philosophy, an alternative method of philosophizing, uh, and that it is not very easily translated into analytic philosophical terms. I think what has to happen is that the analytic philosopher with his own, you know, strengths and weaknesses has to be initiated into the more classical theistic way of thinking about God. He can no longer think about God as an individual object that has some, you know, maximally consistent set of great making properties or whatever the hell, you know, analytic philosophers talk about. He has to think about God differently. He cannot think about him as, a, as an individual with properties. He has to think about him as pure subsistent being, um, as pure actuality itself, which already sort of explodes the capacities of analytic philosophy for talking or for thinking. Analytic philosophy teaches us to think about everything in terms of an individual with properties. Uh, but God is precisely not an individual with properties. So either analytic philosophy cannot think about God or it has to learn a different way of thinking. And here I, I wonder whether I've uh, provoked some measure of consternation or, con uh, or uh, disappointment or confusion in Gavin. Let's see what he has to say. Oh, there he is. Sorry, sorry. Unstable internet connection. Yeah, it's back again. Did you, did you miss what I said? Um, I heard you talking about God as pure actuality and having to initiate the analytical philosopher into that. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. So I, I, my suggestion was that analytic philosophy is not really um, appropriate or capable of expressing the idea that God is pure actuality and that in order to really understand the idea, you have to enter into an, a different way of thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Would you like me to come in yes, on please. that? Yeah. So, um, the first thing I want to say is um, we're talking about the limits of analytical philosophy for classical theism. I want to get out of the way what I take to be the positive side of analytical philosophy for you know, classical theists or what it can offer is. The first thing is um, analytical philosophy um, really does concern itself with meaning and the nature of meaning, the significance of language uh, and the significance of thought. And there is a strong strand in analytical philosophy, which is uh, committed to realism. Um, and so tries to overcome skeptical doubt about our knowledge of uh, the world. I'll not call it the external world because already then we'll be into the, you know, the mind's world sort of thing. But uh, there, there is a strong strand in analytical philosophy and it's been there from the beginning, which is committed to realism, you know, just cold hard realism about the world. And that's something that uh, I take classical theists to be committed to. Um, 
all the classical theists with which I am familiar are more or less realists about the world. Uh, they accept that we can have knowledge of the world and we have knowledge, our knowledge that the world is thus and so is because the world is thus and so. So I think, you know, that's something positive in analytical philosophy, which uh, can be, you know, of assistance to the classical theists. Also, I think what's quite useful in analytical philosophy is that there's a strong critique of Cartesian dualism, uh, the idea of the, you know, separation of mind and body and that the soul is some sort of, you know, separate substance from the body. Um, that's something which is of benefit to um, the uh, classical theists within the Christian tradition, at least, because um, the Christian anthropology is generally not Cartesian. Okay, so um, that, that, that critique of uh, Cartesian substance dualism uh, really is, you know, of aid to the classical theists, uh, theists uh, in the Christian tradition. Having said that, Classical theists have their own reasons for why thinking, you know, Cartesian dualism is a problem and why realism is true. It's just that, you know, um, that they sit along nicely, you know, with some of the reasoning of the analytical philosophers here. Now, where I think the real limits are is, and St Stephen just, you know, nailed it right away, it's in the metaphysics of the matter. Analytical philosophy, whilst it's engaged in metaphysics now, um, has real trouble coming to terms with the being of things with the existence of things. And this is something that we were talking about earlier in the limitations of analytical philosophy. I mean, say that, I'm sure, you know, an analytical philosopher will say, hey, I'm an analytical philosopher and I can, uh, I understand Thomas the essay and all that. And I mean, to which my response is like, right, you're a philosopher and you've understood this. So tell me what's anal particularly analytic about your way of philosophizing. Okay, so that's just, a, that's, that's the qualification there. Um, but as, we, as we've been discussing, analytical philosophy has an issue uh, with thinking about existence um, because, you know, either it's, you know, uh, to, to be is to be the value, the value of a bound variable, the cookie cutter, you know, sort of uh, view of existence, or existence is, you know, indexical, David Lewis and Nathan Salmon, or it's, you know, some sort of actualist version of existence where existence is always understood, never in itself, but always in terms of something else. So existence is, has to be subservient to some sort of a more intelligible, or more clear or more logical uh, category than it is in itself. With that in place then, um, we, we just can't have a metaphysics of, of thomistic essay, let's say, or, or the act of existence. And if we can't have that, then I think probably the strongest demonstration for the existence of God and articulation of the nature of God as pure existence itself, i.e. the thomist account, um, is just uh, unintelligible uh, within analytical philosophy. And that's kind of, you know, what we're seeing in some of the recent discussions, you know, where we are seeing some analytical philosophers engage um, with uh, Aquinas' more existential proof, that there is difficulty in understanding what the actual proof is, and then that turns into the objections, objections which don't understand the metaphysics or which only make sense on different metaphysics, or which only engage, say, with, you know, uh, and the counter presentation of Aquinas's uh, existential proof, which itself is from within the analytic tradition and it doesn't really, you know, go really hard into uh, Aquinas's metaphysics of essay, but tries to make that um, understandable within the analytic tradition and thus, I think, weakens the argument. Um, it seems to me that the strongest case for classical theism is Aquinas's uh, based on the metaphysics of essay. And if we can't articulate that in analytic philosophy or an analytic metaphysics, then that's going to be a real problem for classical theism. We just can't, you know, articulate classical theism. Fortunately for me, I'm not, you know, sort of um, kind of limited by, you know, a commitment to the categories of analytical philosophy, you know. So, I mean, I, I saw Aquinas's metaphysics of essay as intelligible and understandable and was convinced by the argumentation um, more so than I was uh, by, you know, the analytical way of doing philosophy. So whilst that's a, a limit um, for analytical philosophy within classical theism, it's not a limit for me as a classical theist because I think philosophy is bigger than analytical philosophy. So Stephen, does that kind of resonate with some of the stuff that you were saying? Yes, I think, I think so. I, so I, I was making the point that uh, the idea, right, the definition of God as pure actuality, uh, mm. you know, simply cannot be formulated in in like the language of predicate logic for example or, or first yeah. order logic or something yeah. you know there is an x such that x is purely actual and x is purely mm. actual if and only if for every possible property right it doesn't mm. have yeah that just doesn't make sense and it doesn't get at the point um yeah. one one further uh 
conjecture that I would like to make or a proposal that I would like to make, and I'd especially like to hear your thoughts about this, uh, Gavin. Um, I think that analytic philosophy also, because of its emphasis on predicate logic um, um, and various other uh, contributing factors, I think that predicate analytic philosophy does not really make it easy for people to understand the apophatic wing of classical theism and the role that ignorance or non-understanding or non-knowledge of God uh, plays in the classical theistic conception of God. Uh, you know, you could multiply a quote ad nauseum from classical theists who say, we don't understand what God is. John of Damascus says it straightforwardly and very nicely, I think, in his uh, discussion on the Orthodox faith. What God, is, you know, that God exists is clear, but what he is in essence and nature is totally unknown to us. And, you know, Aquinas says it straightforwardly in, the, in both of the summas. We don't know what God is, right? We don't have positive knowledge of God's essence. We only really know what God is not. Um, and again, John of Damascus later on in that same passage says, it's better to think about God in total abstraction from any creaturely reality, right? So when we think about God, we have to set aside everything that is creaturely uh, in order to understand as well as we can or as much as we can what God is. Um, I think that the problem with analytic philosophy is that it doesn't, it doesn't teach people to, to recognize when you can have a grasp of something uh, and this grasp at the same time is not comprehensive. It's not, a, it's not an understanding grasp. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, sort of a pre-categorial grasp, mm -hmm. you might call it, uh, in, in more Husserlian yeah. terms. Um, this, this is something that, incidentally, I think is a, a strong aspect of the continental tradition. And this is, a, this is an idea that I learned from D.C. Schindler's book, The Catholicity of Reason. He talks about reason as, you know, having sort of like two forms of contacts with being. On the one hand, there's a pre-categorial, non, you know, comprehensive contact between being and reason and then on top mm -hmm. of that there's what you might call a categorical reason uh, under uh, contact which consists in understanding right s is p mm -hmm. um, it's yeah, one yeah. thing to grasp in the pre-categorial way the presence of the thing and it's another thing to grasp you know s is p the categorical is built on top of the pre-categorial um, mm -hmm. i think what happens in classical theism and the the arguments for classical theism is that we attain to a grasp of god as there as the ground of things as the cause of existence mm -hmm. but we also simultaneously recognize that we cannot make various predications of him right they won't yeah. they simply won't be adequate and this mm -hmm. is i think what a lot of analytic philosophers don't understand or they can't seem to get that that you can mm -hmm. have the sense that something is there you can be in a, in a kind of a pre-categorial contact with it and at the same time recognize the inadequacy of any kind of categories you might try to apply to it. Um, yeah. It's this special way of seeing that analytic philosophy doesn't train people for. And so they assume that if you can't make statements about something, you must be contradicting yourself because, of course, that's a statement about it, um, you know, or, or else you're simply not in contact with anything at all. You're confused. Waiting for Gavin. Yeah, for a second there, I thought like both of us, all, everyone froze and I was like, wait, what? <laughs> hey, Gavin. Okay, we're back at it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, so I mean, that, that sort of negative theology, the apophatic tradition, I think that, it, that that is going to be an issue for analytical philosophy. And it actually kind of, you know, dovetails with a, a, the second point that I've written down here, which is an issue that analytic philosophy, it, it can't seem to think its way into absolutely fundamental uh, realities which are intelligible in themselves, but they're unanalyzable um, uh, with the, the various categories of analytical philosophy. It just, just can't think its way into them. And in order to think its way into such realities, it has to have that pre-categorial grasp or a kind of an intuition of the reality of things where it can apprehend but not fully comprehend uh, the reality in question. Um, and um, that, that's just an issue with analytical philosophy in general, not, not, not just with um, uh, analytical philosophy um, within uh, philosophy of religion. It's, it's a kind of a limitation of analytical philosophy in general that it can't think its way into intelligible, but fundamental and uh, unanalyzable um, realities, such as essay, such as the act of existence. Um, and so it always tries to interpret that or come to terms with it in terms of um, what it is comfortable with or what does make sense to it. And that's the inevitalizing tendency um, that I find in analytic philosophy. And if, if you have a philosophical way of thinking, which does have these inevitalizing tendencies, 
then negative theology it just isn't going to make any sense because if it's uh, if the reality under question is not capturable um, within a, a kind of a univocal account of that reality, well then you know um, it, 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 it's not a reality which is going to figure in your philosophical way of thinking. And you know the negative tradition in, in theology is saying that you you can have an awareness or an apprehension of, of the reality of the divine. Yet when you try to make sort of affirmative predications of that, um, you, you, you're going to find her. Uh, that, that, that's going to be a problem. Um, if one is exclusively a negative theologian, you know, at best what you can do is you say what God is not. Um, but that's, that's not going to please somebody with a univocalizing mindset. So I would like to ask Gavin a question. Um, or I, I would rather I would I would like to sort of test the waters and see sort of how you would uh, respond to me on this particular issue. One thing that I noticed in the objections that some analytic uh, philosophers or people who are trained in analytic philosophy bring against classical theism is that they inevitably uh, make use of sort of creaturely concepts and creaturely realities in interpreting the language about God and then find that they yield all kinds of contradictions. So let's take, for example, our friend Joe Schmid's argument uh, about divine simplicity and knowledge. Um, he says, you know, that, uh, you know, in the world, in the possible world where God doesn't create anything, that does God know uh, that there is nothing, right, or that he hasn't created anything? If he does know that, then his knowledge must be different than in the present world where he does know that he's created, you know, uh, uh, the world and so on and so forth. My response to Joe about this was that he is um, imputing to God a specific conception of knowledge or attributing to God a, a specific form of knowing, which is ultimately creaturely. Uh, creaturely knowing is at, you know, at its heart sort of passive and receptive. I know in the first place because I make a judgment about a reality that is pre-given to me, right? If there's nothing, you know, my knowledge is always a sort of a response to a prior, you know, disclosure or revelation or whatever. I form a judgment on the basis of uh, some experience. But God's knowledge cannot be passive like that. He can't simply know in this sort of receptive and, and passive way because, again, he's pure actuality. He, he doesn't have passive potentialities. He cannot be affected by things. So if by no we mean that God is receptive to the revelation of, you know, the disclosure of truth and forms a corresponding judgment or something like that. Of course, God doesn't know anything in that sense because he's not like that. He is, he's pure actuality. Um, but the problem seems to be is that, you know, the problem seems to be that unless we talk about knowledge in this purely univocal way with all the, you know, in the way that it applies to creatures, then, you know, why would we say that God knows anything at all? Uh, you know, so the difficulty here is, you know, on the one hand, you have to recognize the limitations of predications made of God. When we talk about God's knowledge or God's power or God's love or whatever, we don't mean exactly the same thing that we mean in creatures. Um, but then the problem for, for the analytic philosopher becomes, okay, well, what is it exactly that is being said? And why would we call that love or why would we call that knowledge or, or power or whatever? Uh, you know, how would you think about that, Gavin? What would you, what would you say in response to the, to the problem? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing to say is, um, if we can, could we keep, you know, any of our other interlocutors, you know, and not name them by name? Ah, just because, my mistake. you know, yeah, they're, they're just not here to defend themselves. And, you know, I mean, maybe we have published or I've published or you've published something and they haven't. And it would just be unfair on them, you know. So uh, if we'll just keep, you know, our other interlocutors, you know, not, not mention them by name, that, that'd be great. Um, but I mean, to the issue, um, I, I, I think it is an issue that when we conceive of, you know, any sort of, you know, features of God um, uh, and conceive of those as if they were uh, exactly the same as the way creatures have them, then yes, we do run into all sorts of problems. Um, because of course, if we are going to say that God, you know, knows or that God is good or that God is powerful, um, he's obviously not like he's obviously not those things in the way in the same way the creatures are uh, and i'm a firm supporter of you know analogical predications of god i mean i i do think we can have negative theology but i also do think you can have the anal analogical predications whereby what what is predicated uh, is the same reality which is predicated of both god and creatures so when we say that both god and creatures are good we're meaning goodness Okay, so we, we are meaning that they are good, but the way in which God is good is different from the way in which creatures are good. So creatures are good, say, for instance, by participation. They're, they're limited instances of the good. They're not identical to the good itself. 
whereas uh, God is the good itself. And the common uh, sort of ratio or logos of goodness there is that it's, it's being as desirable. Um, God is being as desirable in his essence, uh, whereas creatures aren't li like that. They, they are limited instances of goodness. They, they, have they have goodness as, you know, in a limited way. And the same applies to, say, knowledge. You know, let's say, you know, knowledge for knowledge entails having some sort of intentional content. OK, so being able to have the forms of things um, in oneself without becoming those things. So if I have knowledge of a tree, it's because, let's say, I have the form of the tree in me, but I don't actually become the tree. Whereas the tree doesn't have knowledge because once a tree takes on a different form, say a desk or a chair, it becomes a desk or a chair and it's no longer a tree. Um, so uh, a, a knower has intentional content. Now, the way in which God has intentional content is different from the way in which we have intentional content because, as you pointed out, it's objects in the world which cause that content or in us, or we cooperate with those objects and, you know, we produce uh, thoughts are produced in us by the use of our intellect. Where it's not the same in God, because God as pure existence itself, um, he understands simply himself, and in understanding himself, understands every way in which his being could be manifested. Every, all the various individual ways in which his being could be manifested. So what he understands are not all these different sort of ideas. He only understands himself. And it's kind of like, you know, when you read Euclid, okay, and you're at the start of Euclid and you have all the various different definitions and axioms, and they kind of power all the demonstrations which come later in Euclid. Imagine if they were all reduced to just to one. And from that one sort of axiom, you were able to just deduce everything. In Euclid. So imagine that sort of, you know, uh, notion. Well, that's what it's like in God. All he understands is this one thing, which is himself. But in understanding that, everything else then is contained, you know, primordially within that understanding. So again, knowledge is having intentional content. It is understanding something. But the way in which, you know, God does that is different from the way in which, you know, creatures do that. And so what you see there is that the, the property which is predicated of God is the same property which is predicated of creatures, but it's predicated in a different way. The, the, the mode of predicating is different for each. So it's the, same, the, it's the same reality which is predicated, but the mode of predication is different. I think what this involves is learning to see the reality designated by the predicate mm -hmm. when it is applied to the creature as a kind of a participation in the reality which is in God. Right, so yeah. the creature is yeah. no longer the standard, right? Creaturely knowledge is no longer the standard of what knowledge is. Uh, if you do set up creaturely knowledge as the standard for knowledge, then you're left at best with a negation. God does not know, yeah. right, like that. Yeah. If creaturely knowledge is knowledge, then God does not know. Uh, yeah. But what you learn to see is the creaturely phenomenon as a kind of a participation in the divine phenomenon, uh, yeah. so that the order is the other way around. True knowledge, if we're gonna talk about knowledge at all, is the way that God knows. We know in a sort of a participated and analogical way, uh, which is different than is appropriate for us as creatures. But the paragon of knowledge, the paradigm of knowledge is really the divine knowledge, which is not like our knowledge in certain relevant respects. Would that, yeah. would that be an accurate, I think, uh, yeah. concept in your view? Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, it really gets to the heart of the matter that um, classical theists are saying that um, God, there, there, there's nothing that it's like to be God except by being God. God is completely other than creatures, but uh, we can, you know, reason to and deduce truths about God, which are not revealed, and uh, we can discover that in philosophy. Uh, now, it seems that an analytically trained individual is going to have a hard time with that, because given the univocalizing tendencies of analytical philosophy, anything which is wholly other than creatures is ipso facto, uh, it doesn't fit into any of the ca creaturely categories that the analytical philosopher will use. And so we're back to, to your original point that um, the analytical philosopher has trouble uh, thinking his or her, her way um, into, the, into this reality that we can, of which we can have some apprehensive knowledge, but not you know, a complete comprehensive knowledge. Yeah, so I mean, it, it seems like we're, we're both uh, in a good place of agreement, right? So I'm wondering then, um, we could either go in one or two directions, right? I mean, I mean, I really like how uh, Stephen mentioned a particular objection, right? Um, do you think, I mean, would this have any ramifications for let's say, you know, like a, a conversation on existential inertia, 
right? Because it seems mm -hmm. to me that, um, you know, under classical theism, it's best to just view God as the supreme, truest reality, right? So that um, this, this idea that something could persist independently of God just becomes immediately strange to us. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a way in which we could, you know, like this, would this shape, right, how we approach the existential inertia debate or try to reason with someone who's advocating this idea and try to get them to see why it wouldn't even be plausible, right, from the get-go in our view? Yeah, I, I like that you bring up existential inertia. This is the new hot topic because um, a certain shared common friend of ours uh, has been proposing existential inertia as a way out of uh, certain uh, familiar proofs for the existence of God, which classical theists might offer. Uh, and his arguments are good. They're not bad arguments at all. So it, this is not to say that the, the discussion is, is, is not taking place at a very high level. You know, our friends' arguments are very good and they're worth taking seriously. Uh, but I think it's also true that existential inertia is really only thinkable from within a, a specific metaphysical perspective, one that is more, you know, characteristic or familiar within analytic philosophy than it is within, um, you know, classical uh, you know, different uh, classical philosophical traditions like Thomism or Platonism or whatever. Um, I have have written recently about this on Facebook and I intend at some point to write a paper about it. And this is, I've been thinking a lot about this uh, for a while now as a result of uh, discussions had online. Um, and I, you know, personally for me, like if I'm just going to be honest and also at the same time, you know, extreme for the sake of rhetoric, I think existential inertia is the devil's doctrine. This is like the great Satan of analytic metaphysics because uh, as Christians, we believe that things are held in existence in every moment by Christ. You know, all things are uh, by him, through him and for him. Uh, things, he, all things hold together in him. Uh, this notion that a thing, once it's in existence, simply persists unless something else, uh, you know, destroys it. Uh, I think it puts too great a distance and a metaphysical independence between the created object and God. Um, so that, and I think also inevitably it ends up uh, turning God into simply another object that has the power to produce different objects in themselves rather than being pure actuality as in Thomism. So I, I think that this notion of existential inertia really is like, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a metaphysically dangerous notion because its plausibility is founded upon an understanding of existence uh, and an understanding between God and the world as cause and effect, uh, which is very different from Thomism and classical metaphysics more generally. And that can lead, I think, eventually to very difficult problems in the doctrine of God. So I don't take existential inertia lightly. And it's all the more difficult for me because the arguments in favor are pretty good. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, it, it's worth taking seriously. And my own opinion is that existential inertia uh, basically gains its plausibility on the basis of a certain what I call hermeneutic of existence or hermeneutic of actuality. I think that you have to think of existence in a certain way um, and then once you begin to think of existence in that way, once you take that interpretation of existence, existential inertia becomes a really plausible doctrine. But if you adopt a different view of existence, then it no longer becomes plausible. It loses its plausibility altogether. Uh, namely, I think that existential inertia presupposes what I've called a local uh, hermeneutic of existence or this idea of existence as akin to a place or a placement. Uh, and this idea is initially plausible because we talk about existence in sort of spatial or local language. We talk about things being brought into existence or things coming into existence or things being in existence and being taken out of existence and so on, right? So we use this language that has to do with place and space and placement uh, about existence, even though, even though like really we're being metaphorical, but the, the, the words themselves retain their connotative force. Um, and once you think about existence in this way, in this sort of local way, then it becomes plausible to think of it as inertial, just like we think something's positioning in space is inertial. Once I put the chair, you know, in the, in the patio, it stays there unless something acts upon it, right? Its relation to its place is inertial. And if we think of existence also as a kind of a place, like a, you know, a sort of a, something akin to a place, you put something in existence, it stays there unless something takes it out, then existential inertia becomes obvious. There's, there's nothing, there's no need of anything to keep my chair on the patio, right? Once it's there, it's there. And as long as nothing acts upon it, it'll stay there. Um, so also there's no need of a sustaining cause once something is in existence, if you think of existence according to this local hermeneutic. But I, my own view is that existential inertia loses its plausibility once you begin to think of exist, existence, not locally as in as something you know, akin to a place or placement, uh, but rather ontologically. When you think of existence as for example, the unity of the ontological constituents of a thing. Let's take form and matter, right? Uh, 
we know that uh, you know, ordinary objects are composites of form and matter. We also know that when we do the analysis of the form matter composite, the two principles stand in potentiality to one another, right? Matter by itself is undefined and therefore can take on any form. Whereas the form by itself is general and you can have multiple objects that share the same form. So the two principles, although they're united, do not have any essential connection to one another. It's not like this matter is pointing to that form or this form to that matter and vice versa. Something else could have had the same form. This matter could have taken on a different form. Um, so because they are united and because they're both you know, antecedently in potentiality towards their unity, um, then there has to be something that activates this unity. And that's true at every moment that it exists. It's always true that the form and the matter of a thing are in potentiality to one another, and yet that they cannot explain their own unity. So there's always need of something outside of the form matter composite, something that is not itself a form matter composite, to explain their unity, right? If you begin to think uh, according to this ontological hermeneutic of existence, once you see the existence of a thing as the unity of its ontological constituents, then the idea of, of uh, well, more specifically, the, you know, the, the contingent, right, sort of unnecessary unity of its ontological constituents, then the idea of existential inertia falls away. And you are brought almost straight away to the idea of something that is pure actuality, that is not ontologically composite, that just is, right, just pure existence, and that confers unity and existence upon composite objects. So my own way of thinking is this. Existential inertia is plausible as an idea if you adopt a certain hermeneutic of existence, if you adopt a certain interpretation of what existence is, but it loses its, possibil its plausibility once you begin to think about existence in more ontological rather than local terms, um, you know, in the way that is more typical of the classical philosophical um, tradition, like in Neoplatonism or in Aristotelianism or Thomism or whatever. I think I will also say this to make the connection to analytic philosophy. I think that something like the local hermeneutic of existence is more sort of taken for granted in the background of, of um, analytic philosophy because, you know, for example, somebody might think of existence as a property, just like, uh, you know, just like something's position in space is a property, right? So, and it's a property such that once you have it, it tends to stay there unless something else takes it away. Right. So I, I think, again, like you have to learn to see existence through different eyes. You have to learn to sort of set aside the, the dispositions and the, you know, the, the prejudices that have been, in, in, you know, that have been inculcated in you through analytic philosophy in order to see existence in a different way. And then the idea of existential inertia disappears. All right. So I'll have Gavin um, just uh, contribute his thoughts to that. And then for the sake of time, I'll move to the last question after Gavin speaks. So, um, unlike Stephen, I don't take existential inertia all that seriously, and um, <laughs> I certainly don't think it's the devil <laughs> or, you know, satanic or anything like that. So, um, here are my thoughts on existential inertia. The first thing is that the, the existential inertia objection, uh, so, so Graham Oppie, you know, he, he wrote the paper, you know, and it was, it was against Beezer. Uh, and I was against a, a, an issue in Feaser, you know, from Feaser's five proofs, and the existential inertia objection is being pushed against Feaser uh, and Feaser's five proofs. And this is one of the issues that I have, and this is why I think, you know, that the, the discussion is kind of being blown out of proportion. He's criticizing Feaser. You're not criticizing Thomas. Feaser isn't Thomas. <laughs> and um, it, it's wonderful that Feaser has got so many people reading Thomas, and people are engaged with Thomas, you know, as a result of Feaser's work. But, you know, Feaser is another Thomist, you know, amongst many Thomist commentators. And, you know, we don't all agree with him, and he doesn't agree with all of us. And, um, but unfortunately, um, a lot of people um, are, are, are coming to read Thomas um, from Feaser, or they're, they're coming to think about Thomas from Feaser but not going to Thomas himself, or not going to the other Thomistic commentators themselves. And what I see in a lot of this discussion um, online um, an awful lot is that there, there's, an, uh, there's a lack of appreciation of the, the, those big name major Thomists in the 20th century, um, those neo-Thomists who really um, developed the existentialist metaphysics of Aquinas and brought that to the fore. I'm thinking of Etienne Gilson, Joseph Owens, Jacques Maritain, but also Corn Cornelio Fabro, Louis Bertrand Geiger, you know, these people, uh, Joseph de Finance, these people writing in French, you know, in Europe, you know, and in Belgium in the mid 20th century. There's a real ignorance 
um, uh, of their work in a lot of this discussion, both on the thomistic side and the non-thomistic side, because it seems to be that, you know, the, the discussion is all around how Fieser has presented these proofs and, you know, um, how best we can poke at the different premises in it. And to relate it back to your uh, original, the way you originally brought this up, Swan, is that, you know, well, maybe if we think about God as holding everything in existence, does that, you know, um, kind of, you know, get rid of the existential inertia objection? Because once we establish that God exists, we can see that existential, existential inertia is, um, you know, it's just implausible. Well, that's kind of how Fieser responds to existential inertia in that article in the American Catholic Phil Quarterly, I think about five or six years ago. Um, I mean, for my part, um, I think that's a bit problematic because we need to um, show that uh, on the metaphysics of existence or in the metaphysics of essay, um, that existential inertia is implausible just on the basis of that metaphysics. And it's that metaphysics then which gets us the proof of God. So if you're going to use a metaphysics of existence, um, which shows existential inertia to be implausible, um, to get to God, then it's not with the affirmation of God that we show existential inertia to be implausible. It's with the actual metaphysics itself. Um, but with all this engagement with Fieser, and this all blowing up because, you know, you know, God forbid, Fieser has been attacked. You know, Thomism must be undermined. <laughs> the first thing to say is that Fieser is a Thomist and he's a big boy and he's very capable, you know, of defending himself against Oppie, and I'm sure he will, uh, and, and any others. But... <laughs> You know, he, he's not Aquinas, and um, and cer certainly, you know, I, I, I don't see in Fieser's work, you know, the really sustained engagement with the metaphysics of existence, which is needed to, say, get the de ante argument off the ground and to defend the, the de ante argument. Now, maybe, you know, Fieser, in defending himself against Oppie, will get into that, you know, fair play to him if he does. So, um, you know, I mean, for my part, I've got a, a paper coming out on existential inertia, um, it's existential inertia and Aquinas' way to God, where I do engage with the, the existential inertia issue. But um, the way in which I engage with it is to show that if we consider the metaphysics of essay as Aquinas considers it, um, we see that existential inertia is an implausible position. The reason being is because existence isn't something which subsists in a subject in the way the color subsists in an object. Um, color exists in an object and it continues to, to exist in an object so long as you have no cause to stop it existing in the object. But when you have something which comes along, which, you know, causes the color, that particular color, say red, to subsist in the object, say you dye it a different color, then that's when it ceases. Existence isn't like that, okay? Objects subsist or participate in existence, in their individual acts of existence. This is a real key theme in Aquinas' metaphysics of existence. It's that objects participate in existence as the act of all acts. And this is something that the French Thomists, Fabro and Geiger, really hammered home. Um, and, but if one isn't engaged with those guys, one kind of doesn't see that. Um, that objects participate in existence. It's not that existence sort of subsists in them. So existence is the act of all acts, and maybe I'll kind of, you know, diverge from what Stephen said. Existence is the act of all acts. Isn't, you know, um, kind of this sort of act which unifies, say, the matter and form or the other metaphysical components of the thing. Rather, it's that without which you wouldn't even have any of those metaphysical components or the thing itself. Um, so those metaphysical components, they're, you know, kind of coexisting with the thing, there are kind of components of the thing, but it's the thing that has existence and it participates in its existence, such that um, were it not to have existence, it would be nothing. So things don't naturally exist. They don't exist of themselves unless they, you know, have existence as a distinct act, making them exist, they would simply cease to be. So contrary to, you know, what some commentators might want to say that, you know, um, that we need, there, there has to be some sort of, you know, cause which, you know, sort of overcomes the thing and causes it to cease to be. Well, no, that's not it at all. Things don't naturally exist. They don't have existence as identical to their essences. Rather, they participate in their existence in the way that, you know, the atmosphere participates in the light of the sun. So for as long, um, it, it participates in the light of the sun to be illuminated for as long as it's illuminated. 
you know, it ceases to be illuminated as soon as it ceases to participate in the light of the sun. So existing things, you take away, you know, some sort of cause of their existence, they cease to exist. So it's not the case that they, they can be given existence and then you, something comes along, you know, and just stops them from existence. It's more like how the sun is the illumination of the atmosphere is from the sun. It's not like, you know, the sun illuminates and then the sun could disappear and the illumination would remain. Rather, the atmosphere participates in the illumination of the sun and so existing things participate in their existence. And that's a kind of an important switch, uh, a way of thinking about existence, which kind of um, is present in Thomas and is present in his participation metaphysics. That's his Platonism coming out. Um, and that's something which isn't adverted to, um, I don't think, sufficiently well in these discussions of existential inertia. It's certainly not on, on Oppie's radar, um, from what I read of that piece. Um, I know I think he might have another piece in submission. Um, again, I think it's against Beezer, um, but it, it's definitely not on the radar in any of these discussions. And that's unfortunate because, you know, the, the whole thrust of Thomas's, you know, uh, proof of God um, relies on that metaphysics. And, so if one is going to object to that sort of proof of God, one really needs to, you know, sort of do that heavy lifting and engage him with that metaphysics. And I mean, I don't see that being done. So um, I don't see, I, I don't really take the, the issue all that seriously because I think, you know, um, the, the metaphysics, you know, has good buttressing reasons for it, which um, have yet to be attacked. I think that the secret here is seeing the existence of a thing at any moment at which it exists uh, as an accomplishment, as as uh, um, as an accomplishment that is inexplicable on the basis of the thing itself and its its ontological composition. So what we need for that is much like you say, we need a, a a notion of essay. We have we have to have some understanding of existence, what I call the hermeneutic of existence. We have to have some way of understanding the existence of a thing so as to bring to light the fact that at every moment that a thing exists, that's an accomplishment, and it's not like it's simply being read or my being human at every moment, right? Something that's explained on my own. Uh, it's an accomplishment that is only explicable on the basis of an external principle. So what we need is a way of, well, what we need in order to communicate the implausibility of existential inertia to its proponents um, is a way of understanding existence that can bring to light this fact of the continued existence of a contingent thing as an accomplishment that it's inexplicable on its own basis. Um, uh, and that will entail, I think you will agree with me, seeing existence not simply as one more property that a thing has and that it, you know, that it is given to it and then can be taken away or whatever, right? So the, the, ex the existence of a thing um, is outside of the thing itself, so to speak, and it comes from the outside and the thing participates in it, but it's not like a, a further constituent of the thing, uh, just like its redness might be. So I think on this point, even if we might disagree on some finer points about, you know, metaphysics and unity and all that, I think, we're, mm. I think we can agree, and you can contradict me if I'm wrong, we agree on the, the way to take in showing yeah. that existential inertia is, is, is an implausibility. Yeah, and I think we would be agreed further that um, if we were to go that way and, you know, sort of try to articulate that metaphysics, we would be moving very, you know, we, we, we would be moving away from analytic philosophy, uh, and yeah. by the end we'd be very far outside you know, the yes. of analytic philosophy. Yeah, absolutely. So I think we've actually hit basically two hours or we're very close. So I think this is a, maybe a good place to stop, especially since I actually have a episode coming out, um, I think next week or two weeks from now on existential inertia. So this is a topic of discussion. So I want to thank both of you gentlemen for coming out today and just having this conversation. And I really appreciated how Gavin, you kind of, you know, gently corrected me, but of course, like, you know, um, yeah, I didn't want to, I didn't want to propose like a dialectic of you begin with God and then you show existential nurse is false, although that somewhat was implied by what I said, but I appreciated how you're hitting right at the core of what needs to be said. And I think this uh, conversation today, and if you want to shortly comment on this, I'd appreciate it. But I think the conversation that we had today basically is hitting on the fact that at some point, you know, we're not going to have any progress in this conversation. We're constantly going to be talking past one another until the analytics kind of and, and until we, us classical theists, right, understand each other's traditions and know how to kind of move the conversation properly forward or else, you know, we're just going to be kind of stuck in this endless loop where we're saying, you don't understand me and I don't understand you, so forth, so forth. Um, would you say that's a fair summation? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I think just as a philosopher, I think for me, uh, I need to understand any other philosopher that I read and that I find interesting.
Uh, and um, I mean, you might, I don't know if you've noticed that, I've, I've never sort of identified myself as, you know, a scholastic, continental, analytic philosopher or whatever. I do, I do identify myself as a Thomist. Um, but in doing that, that's because, that's because I think Thomas was right um, on the issues, um, on nearly every issue of philosophical significance, I think he was right. So I, I do identify myself as a Thomist, but generally, I mean, that, 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 that's just my being a philosopher. Uh, and I do think that, you know, we, we do need to put the effort into understanding, um, you know, the different traditions in philosophy. Sometimes I feel that um, people working outside the analytic tradition in philosophy are putting in all the effort to understand analytic philosophy. And I don't feel that that's always being reciprocated, but I do know that there are analytical philosophers out there who are engaged um, in the non-analytical tradition and um, they themselves see that there is a blurring of the boundaries between the traditions. Um, but, but generally I get the sense that there's more effort being put in by non-analytic philosophers to uh, engage with analytic philosophy than there is of analytical philosophers engaging outside of that. And again, I think maybe that's you know, just, a, just a hangover of the historical situation of analytical philosophy where uh, it was, you know, at one point taken to be philosophy simpliciter or per se, and maybe there's a bit of a hangover of that. Um, you know, why, why should we engage with something outside the analytical tradition? At, at worst, it's at, at best it's just odd, and at worst it's unintelligible. Um, I'm not saying all analytical philosophers think like that, but it, it's just my sense of things, and maybe I just don't have enough experience of you know analytical philosophers. All right, Stephen, anything to add or? Yeah, um, I, you know, I think that the final question we were going to answer is whether a classical theist can be an analytic philosopher. I think that this is a great question in my own answer, which is, again, intentionally provocative because that's the sort of person that I am. Um, I think the more you're a classical theist, the less you are an analytic philosopher in general. I think that classical theism is very difficult to maintain and to make plausible in the sort of the general default categories and way of speaking of analytic philosophy. I think that our discussion about existence, especially over the course of this video, has tried to bring that point to the fore, that there are certain concepts which play a central role in classical theism, which are not very easily formulated or appreciated from within the analytic perspective. So I tend to think that the more a person is uh, a classical theist and let's say the tradition of Thomas or something uh, akin to that, the less a person will be a sort of a stereotypically analytic philosopher expressing himself in the ways that analytic philosophers do, making use of the same concepts and the same form of speaking and so on. Uh, perhaps Gavin disagrees with me, but that's, that's my, my sense. Okay, let's I hear do it. Right. Let's just have Gavin say the final word and then we'll wrap up, okay? <laughs> um, I think if anybody was a classical theist, it was John Don Scotus. And I think you're seeing a lot of um, convergence between what's happening in specifically analytic metaphysics in the later half of the 20th century and some of the positions that SCOTUS uh, developed. So it seems to me that if you can affirm some form of SCOTism, well, you're, you're, you're within the, the confines of SCOTUS's classical theism. So um, I don't think, it, I think Stephen's right if it were to come to a thomistic classical theism. The closer you come to Thomistic classical theism, the further away from analytical philosophy you move. But I think something like Scotism, you know, converges quite well, you know, with some strands of contemporary analytic philosophy. That's a fair point. And here, my own limitations are visible. So for me, you know, I think of classical theism and I think of like the, the you know, the top of the pyramid in classical theism as something like Thomism or what I lately have taken to calling pure act theism. And I think that pure act theism really is difficult to formulate and to make sense of in analytical terms. Um, but you're right, if you agree that Scotus is a kind of a classical theist or if Scotism is, is a, you know, a, a species of the genus classical theism, you know, everybody's made the, everybody's made the observation that Scotus really is something like a proto-analytic and he argues and, you know, he, he has a lot of the, the, he has a lot of features and characteristics that are reminiscent of analytic philosophy or that are suggestive of analytic philosophy. So that's, that's a fair correction to make. All right. Well, thank you both for just uh, contributing today to this episode. I now want a shirt that has like all of Stephen's list of like the great Satans, you know, that'd be really fun to have. <laughs> but with that I being said, make a shirt, yeah. <laughs> with that being said, thank you so much. And um, we'll have more uh, content to come.